all by myself. He's in a room all by myself anymore. Look, you know all the words. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of I Don't Give a Flick. I am your host, Johnny Blackburn. Alongside me this week are my co-hosts, as they are every week. Gary Elmore. And Neil Riley. And this week, we are happy to welcome back uh, our friend, Luke. Luke, welcome back to the show. Hey, howdy. Hey, that's me. I'm on the radio. Yeah, baby. Well, you're in podcast land, not on the radio yet. Yeah, get it right. Yeah, come on. Maybe we'll sell the rights to a local radio station and... We'll you really want to know the that. more? Huh? huh? What'd you say? I said you want to know the rest? Buy the rights. How bizarre. I think I actually said you want to know the more. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah you did. That's what it sounds okay. like. God damn it. And that is the voice of a uh, first timer. Uh, we're popping his uh, cherry tonight for, at least for this podcast. We're welcoming Michael to the show. Michael? Hello. Welcome. That That's really how you want to start? It, it is kind of <laughs> how I want to start. Just Hello. be gentle. Jesus. Be gentle. Yeah. And this will be the last time Michael <laughs> is on this podcast. <laughs> Why do we always say that every single time it's our guest first time? Because <laughs> they refuse to come back with that us. That is true. That Possibly. is true. We'll we're usually, we're usually so nice to them, though. Mm, I mean, yeah. we're such a, a fun group of people to hang out with and not, talk to. and Not to that Jacob guy. You're no. usually pretty mean to but him. But he, he's, just, he's, he's just so pathetic. He keeps coming back, asking for more. Yeah. You know, like an abused housewife, pretty much. And you're the abusive husband. Yeah, that's dark. But yeah, kind of got real kinda, dark, got real dark, real quick. fast. Jesus, Jesus, Gary. Uh, this We're going to grow up this podcast real fast. <laughs> we are really, really quick. Uh, so we're going to we're kind of riding the wave that we uh, that we had going on for last week. For those of you that tuned in, we started out season two uh, with an episode on the Star Wars franchise. And that was a lot of fun. S- certainly our longest podcast to date. I think a little over two hours, Gary, altogether. Yeah, yeah I, I, think, I think uh, the top 10 actors one may have been longer. Really? That was yeah. just you and me. OK, damn, we talk a lot. Yeah, we do. Uh, <laughs> uh, and almost too much. Almost. almost. Too much. Uh, and yeah, and we this is something that we're uh, we're trying out for this new season outside of um, taking new recommendations on topics from our guests. We're also looking at doing uh, uh, breaking down franchises. Uh, so tune in for some future episodes where uh, we will take recommendations from our listeners as well as the guests uh, to, for, you know, and it can be anything from James Bond to the Matrix to Indiana Jones to Lord of the Rings. We'll see what happens. You know, there is no no topic that is safe from I don't give a flick. Um <laughs> But this week we're going to be talking about probably the longest running franchise in Hollywood, I would say, or one of them at least, if not the longest. Um, Star Trek is is our I don't know, I topic think this week. Is, pretty is Bond long. is Bond yeah. longer? I think Bond may be longer. No, Bond may be longer. Yeah. Okay. Although Bond is concluding, right? I mean, possibly. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe, maybe they've been saying that they've been saying that for a while. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Um, but one of the longest running ones, uh, Star Trek. And, uh, this week we're going to be breaking down, uh, the series and briefly going over the films that have, uh, been, uh, littered into, excuse me, peppered into the franchise throughout the last 50, 60 years at this point. Yeah. Uh, when was the, when did the first one come out? Gary? 1966. 66. Jeez, man. Oh, I believe the Good cage, God. which was the first episode was actually filmed in 65. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah that makes sense. Okay. All right. Um, so let's, let, let's, let's, uh, let's jump into this here. Uh, we, I kind of want to jump in with our guests first. Uh, Luke, I will start with you. Um, what, what got you into Star Trek just, just as a kid or even as, as, as an adult, I don't really know when you started watching. Um, what got you into it at the beginning? What was so enticing about it for you? Well, you're very professional because I do believe oh, – hold on, squeaky chair for a second. I do believe that uh, I was kind of real-time blogging with you my going through Star Trek. Um, but to those of you who don't know, I was – and Johnny can vouch for this. I was a Star Wars guy basically my whole life, sure. and um, I hated – I hated star trek mostly just because i didn't really care about it and i got sick of hearing about it i would see it on tv and i would i had never watched it for more than a minute or two in mind i would watch about 30 seconds and i'd be like uh this is boring and i would go to something else um but i have a very good friend whose opinion whose taste i really respect who kept telling me for years 
was telling me, you should give it a try. You would really like it. You should give it a try. You know, you have to you have to watch the right episodes and you have to kind of know what you're getting into. But there's still something to it. And um, once quarantine started, I decided, you know what, I'm just going to do it. So I sat down and I started from the beginning. I started with the cage and I went all the way through TOS. I went through the movies and then I went into TNG and then I sort of went back to Enterprise and then Enterprise I kind of fell in love with and went there and then with Discovery. So it was basically a um, it was a conscious choice. Someone said, you know, you should check this out. And I'd been rejecting it. And I finally sat down and checked it out. And I and I just loved it. I just loved it. I remember 10 minutes into the cage. I remember in the cage, if there's any TOS fans out there, there's a scene where Pike is in there. He says, there's a way out of any cage and I'll find it. And I was like, oh, man, this show is awesome. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. refresh my memory, but I don't think Pike made it out of there. In a way, he hey, did. Spoiler alert. I mean, you know. Uh, no, the menagerie, he didn't. In the pilot, the cage that was originally shot, he does get out eventually. He chokes the alien until he releases the mind hold on them, and then they blast their way through when number two and the yeoman, or number one and the yeoman, are beamed down. And uh, then they get out, and then there's a, there's a confrontation on the surface where they, they sacrifice them. So anyway, but yeah, he does get out. Um, in the menagerie, which is the two-parter from season one, they take him back to Talos Four to like retire because he's stuck in that wheelchair. That's that's so crazy. So you didn't you didn't get into this at all until this year or this past year? January. January was when I started watching was when I started watching the cage. And then I just I just went all the way through it and I kept kept going back. There's so many great episodes. The great thing about TOS um is it's basically it's basically the Twilight Zone. And it's so fun. And it's they go to these places and these very crazy situations happen, but they happen in very smart ways. It's not, you know, the writers do know what they're doing and they handle these these topics that if they were done by lesser writers would be silly. But the 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 writers <laughs> on TOS, you know, Gene Kuhn and um who was that other guy who was the big one? Um he did uh, a lot of things anyway. But I, Gene Kuhn is one of the famous ones that produced stuff, but they they handle these ideas so smartly, and it's like you can tell that in some of of these cases they're just repurposing old ghost stories or they're just repurposing old war stories but they put them in the star trek universe in such a clever way that you buy into it so so in in 12 months you've seen is it fair to say you've seen every episode in every movie um no i've stopped off and this is kind of why i'm excited about tonight uh uh, TNG is a lot harder for me. I like TNG, but TNG, the bandwidth, the the next generation, I feel like there's more hits and misses. To me, TOS is only three seasons, and all of season one is great, all of season two is great, and half of season three is great. It, when you get into TNG, it's like season one kind of sucks, season two gets better. It's not really till the best of both worlds, and you kind of get four, five, six, and then six and seven, it kind of starts to dip off a little bit. Uh, so there's just more hits and misses with TNG and it's easier to come to an episode that's just like oh all right I don't care this is kind of whatever okay. and TOS to me is a lot more it's a it's a different setup and it's a lot more it's a lot more consistent with its good writing that just show that just that just shows to I guess to the writing like you like you said to your point that just it must be that addictive um I personally never have really ever gotten into Star Wars at all. So uh, excuse me, Star Trek at all. So yeah. oh, that's one. <laughs> that's one. That's right. <laughs> Strike one. Um, so, you know, I'll just be moderating this tonight. Um, so, Michael, let's jump over to you. Um, what did you get into Star Trek first? How old were you? What were your first memories? Um, kind of what drew you to it? Really, first memories of Star Trek uh, most likely came around middle school. So probably when I was 12, 13 years old mm -hmm. before that. The things that I had watched on television, movies, all of that, nothing was ever what I would consider to be serious. It was more so animated cartoons, like Animaniacs, things of that nature, that was just these little one-off shows that didn't really have any kind of continuity to it, that it moved from episode to episode with a storyline that kept going. Yeah. Um, and Star Trek was really the first one that I, I started following and started watching, mainly because my father watched it, and it was something that I could bond with my father over, which... I think it's kind of a, a common tie with a lot of folks that get into Star Trek is it's kind of that that family aspect gathering around the TV at night, you know, it kind of harkens to the old days of gathering around the radio yeah. to listen to the programs and all of that. Um, and at the time when I started doing that, Deep Space Nine was was coming to its end and Voyager was was really 
starting to hit its stride. Um, so Voyager was the main thing that we watched. And it's funny because Voyager kind of carried me through, even though it ended in uh, 2001. Uh, I continued to watch, you know, rewatch episodes and all that, all the VHS tapes even back then that I was recording on um, until I was able to get the DVDs later on. But he, he doesn't watching, mean that he was recording any broadcast to watch later. That's not what he no, meant. No, no, no. I, I was, I was recording somebody else recording right, somebody yeah, else yeah. recording. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's all, you know, all comes together. But uh, eventually getting the DVDs and taking them with me to college. And it was something that I constantly had going when I was in college that if I was doing it while I was studying. It, it would help me go to sleep at night. It was just kind of a constant. And it may have been something that I carried with me um, uh, from home, basically kind of a, to alleviate a little bit of homesick being at college, just mm -hmm. having something consistent. And so Star Trek served that purpose for me. Um, and in the process, really grew to love it and grew to love sci-fi in general because of it. So I'd always kind of been a fantasy guy before that. Yeah, yeah. And so before you were watching Star Trek, kind of what were you what were you into before that? What was the sci fi trend for you before you had started watching that was Next Generation? What? Because that was kind of all around the same time, I think, for most of us, we started. Right. I would say that 90s. Star Trek was probably my introduction to science fiction. Uh, before that, it was mostly, uh, as I said, animated, animated things of that nature. But um, yeah, Star Trek was really the first science fiction stuff that I started getting into. Then Dad began introducing me to to older science fiction stuff, uh, mm -hmm. kind of some of the Buck Rogers stuff. Nice. Uh, you know, that's when Star Wars kind of picked up in my life was middle school as well. But that had more of the fantasy element to it that I also enjoyed. But yeah. Star Trek was just something that I could share with my dad and really enjoyed that. I think just as yeah, and that as I think just as a, a society in general, especially in today's day and age, we we do that with any any like you're talking about any comfortable piece of home or nostalgia that reminds us of a simpler time in our childhood and stuff. You know, I mean, I I do the same thing to this day with honestly with Family Guy and The Office. Um, you know, even <laughs> to a lesser extent, Always Sunny. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's. That's 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 really nice. Um, Neil, what about you? What was what kind of got you into it originally when you were younger? I mean, kind of the same thing as Michael said. Uh, this was a bonding experience with me and my dad. Uh, my parents were separated, so I was living with my mom most of the time. So when I did go to my dad's on the weekends, one of the things we would do is watch Star Trek The Next Generation. And it had to be when I was pretty young. And I distinctly remember our ritual was during the opening credits we would have to dodge out of the way as the ship flew past us <laughs> and then when we're sitting on the couch we'd have to lift up our feet so that when it comes up from the bottom of the screen it doesn't hit us so that was that was a real fun memory uh, i had with him that That's might, that might be the cutest it. thing you've ever said on this podcast <laughs> <laughs> i love it <laughs> <laughs> Gary, what about you? Yeah, I uh, remember watching uh, Star Trek uh, with my brother Adam, uh, The Next Generation as a kid, um, and then uh, also my brother Tom. And, you know, we'd, uh, you know, we'd watch the shows and we really liked them, uh, liked the storylines of it. Um, and I remember that they would have on, I think it was TNT, uh, they'd do like a next generation they show all the episodes back to back over spring break and you could watch all 176 episodes of the next generation uh in a week wow. uh you had to be dedicated though and you had to do that during spring break and, so and dedicated you and your brothers were i'm yes. assuming oh yeah I, I know you and you and tom remember that one weekend you guys watched every harry potter movie straight yep. within 24 hours that, yes yeah it was, that was, that was something it's very interesting it takes about 18 <laughs> hours to do jeez <laughs> I'm I'm good. Uh, the few of them are okay. Uh, Man. So wh why do you guys why do you guys still love it today? You know, um, I mean, is it is it the nostalgia factor, um, or is it the series to this day they still hold up compared to other series that are coming out right now? Like, I mean, I, I understand like Star Trek's not like Breaking Bad, and it's you know it's not like Game of Thrones, obviously, but those are really popular series right now. I remember back in the day when Next Generation was was the big thing, and I'm sure original series was uh, the big thing back in the back in the '60s. Um, so, Luke, let's loop back around to you. Um, you know why? Why? I guess you've only been watching it for the last year, um, but why do you think these series still hold up today against the new series that are coming out? Well, yeah, and I think, you know, to that point, you know, I was someone who came at it with every excuse to not like 
right. old Star Trek. You know what I mean? Yeah. I had no, I was watching it because someone told me I should watch it. And I fell in love pretty quick. And I think that proves that it does still hold up even to the cynical eye. And I think at least for TOS, I mean, I think with all of them, it's it's basically the writing. The writing is really good. And Roddenberry set a, a, a fairly high standard with his style of storytelling and staying away from certain tropes and leaning into other tropes and trying to, for me, for TOS, and I think with TNG too, I can't speak as much for DS9 and Voyager because I can't just can't get into them the way that I can, but it's the characters. <laughs> I mean, anyone who watches TOS knows that Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, they basically are the human. You know, Spock is the logic, McCoy is the emotion, and Kirk has to synthesize these two elements of humanity in order to come through with the best decision. And so the the banter between them, and especially in the movies, um, the relationship that develops between the three of them is so well done. And uh, it's very authentic and it's very real. And uh, it's true, unlike some other uh, f- science fantasy franchises we could mention, the character development is consistent and it goes through in a way that it should logically throughout the entire series, even arguably in Generations. You can say that Generations is bad, but Kirk still acts like Kirk. Mm hmm. Okay. Uh, Michael, what about you? Uh, one of the things that I think kind of holds up, and and I guess this is debatable between any series that's out there, but uh, I always felt like the characters in Star Trek were relatable, whether they mm-hmm. were humans or not. There was always something about them that you could see a little bit of yourself in those characters. Um, but that's something I'll probably talk about with Voyager a little bit later, but character flaws are something that uh, I'm kind of drawn to when it comes to when it comes to any kind of whether it's literature or whether it's film, whether it's television. Uh, I don't want to see a perfect character. Uh, I'm not I'm not necessarily the guy who likes Superman. I'm the guy who likes Batman, the guy who yeah. has a yeah, has a flaw, has something going on that keeps the character moving forward. You can see motivations, you can see struggle, you can see success and triumph. And and I think since that's something that kind of transcends all of literature or film or anything else it's something that you can connect with and kind of keeps you coming back to it okay so before i move on to gary and neil do you guys think that this is both michael and luke do you guys think that series today or over the last decade or two do they not really share those same aspects or elements that series from you know pre-2000 had you think that's something that they're they're lacking i think the problem with Oh, sorry. I think the problem with modern Star Trek um, is, one, it's disconnected from Gene Roddenberry. Okay. Uh, you can say what you will about Rick Berman. Um, he tried very hard to honor Gene's legacy, and he tried very hard to make sure that Star Trek was what Gene, what he thought Gene would want it to be. And I think that Alex Kurtzman and the Bad Robot, or excuse me, it's not bad, it's Secret Hideout, uh, that the Secret Hideout production team I don't think all of them is sort of like that Star Star Wars conversation. I don't think many of these people really get it. And I think they view it more as a vehicle to tell stories of, that have certain messaging that they want to push rather than stories that are thought through with consistent and well-realized character development. So, Luke, how do you feel that uh, Rick Berman uh, – successfully kind of continued on Gene Roddenberry's legacy. I'm just curious to hear that. I don't know if it was successful, but he certainly tried. If you've ever watched any interview with him, he always talks about Gene and how important it was that we do things the way that Gene would want them. And in fact, one of the issues that the writers on Enterprise had with him was that he was too much. He would say things like, well, in Gene's world, the technology can't break, so we can't have Scott Bakula having issues with the technology on the ship because the technology doesn't break. That's not the kind of thing Gene would want. Now, I'm not saying he really, he fully understood Gene's vision, but if you've watched any interview with him and if you've watched any interview with the writers that were involved, uh, it was very important to them because he, for the first two seasons, Rick Berman had worked directly with Gene and Gene had kind of handed the torch onto him. Uh, but like I said, I don't think he did it right all the time but I don't think you can deny that in his head he was trying to make sure that we honored Star Trek and we had a, essentially he was honoring the idea of the future of optimism and the future of hopefulness and the future where humanity has put aside these petty things of racism and sexism. And the problems are the externalities. The problems are the aliens who have their own prejudices that we as humans have to sort of prime 
Prime Directive get involved with as much as we can and sort of show them the right. Never mind Kirk reading the Constitution to the alien, but you know, but that was a good. The episode. idea was is that. <laughs> It was a good episode, and I think everybody should be reading the Constitution, so I'm not going to argue with that. But my point <laughs> is is that that's very, not very prime directive -y, and it's a little bit – it's definitely not what Picard would have done. But the point is is the optimism, and that is, that is this neo – what's the word for it? This postmodern Star Trek where everything is sort of subversive and dark, and the, the authority figures can't be trusted, and the, 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 it's just – I don't think they really understand – property that they're dealing with and i think they don't particularly care to because that's not what their goal is i would agree to that <laughs> i think that's a problem that a lot of long-running franchises have and we talked about this briefly in this not even briefly extensively in the star wars episode you know um the further and further you get away from the original series and the original idea kind of the more convoluted it becomes and it just becomes a little confusing. Um, I don't know, uh, Neil, Gary, Michael, do you, you guys, are you guys in agreement with Luke here? Do you think that he's completely off base? I think that uh, Rick Berman wanted to try and preserve the legacy that Gene Roddenberry left. I don't know how successful he was in doing that. Mm. And I don't know if that was because necessarily Rick Berman didn't get it or if he just didn't have the the power or the sway in the production to make the changes that would have followed um, more closely along with Gene's original ideas. Sure. Um, so I will say that. Yes. OK, I'll say your piece on that. <laughs> I mean, and yeah, I agree with Luke. I do think, you know, the original, the next gen, Deep Space Voyager, they all had such a clean, pristine vision of the future. And I think that's one of the things that made them stand the test of time is that there's that kind of like hope for the future of humanity, that that's what we're striving for. And yeah, the later Star Trek's kind of undo all of that and make it dirtier. And, you know, it just, it doesn't have the same feel. Well, like in uh, uh, Picard, there's a guy that wields a samurai sword and cuts people's heads off, um, which is just fucking retarded. Um, there's no other way to say that. It's a new age, Gary. Yeah, it's a, it's new, a new age in Star Trek. Trek. Yep. Get those samurai swords out, people. I mean, that, uh, just knowing that, that one piece from like Star Trek Picard, I think to anybody that really loves and knows Star Trek makes you understand that That's these people have no fucking clue what this IP is that they're dealing with. So I hadn't seen any episodes of Picard Spoiler and alert. just based off of what you just said, I have no interest in seeing any. Episodes of Picard. <laughs> you can see what it is, right? And this goes to what Johnny says that, and JJ Abrams has said this, they are trying to make Star Trek, Star Wars. And that mm -hmm. whole, that character, that Romulan priest who become like, he's obviously a Jedi. Like he's the knockoff version of a Star Trek Jedi. That's what he's supposed to be. And it's so stupid and it's so transparent and it's so out of place. Yeah. I mean, cause I think that looking at Star Trek and Star Wars, um, those are two very different uh, franchises. They're two very different storylines because Star Trek is about the humanist vision of everyone working together, being great, and human beings, you know, succeeding over their their moral dilemmas. Because most of all of the original yep. series and most of Next Generation were just morality plays on what's right and what's Absolutely. wrong. And mm -hmm. Voyager even had some of that too. And uh, Deep Space Nine, but you know, Star Wars is about, and it's a, it's an adventure story in the stars. So you don't have those sort of deep moral questions. And I think that those two franchises have really lost what they are all about. Cause when you have long, boring Senate scenes in a Star Wars adventures movie, or you have just jam packed action in a Star Trek movie, I think you've lost the message. Yeah. Yeah. And you can see it. You can see it definitely in Star Trek. You can see, I mean, and I don't know if you guys know, but Alex Kurtzman, actually, if you buy the Blu-ray for Star Trek Undiscovered Blu Country, uh, Kurtzman does the commentary for that with uh, Orsi. And it's very interesting to hear Alex Kurtzman give a commentary. Of course, he does Star Trek Four because it's the most popular. You know what I mean? He didn't take on Star Trek, the motion picture. He didn't take on, you know, Undiscovered, uh, you know, Undiscovered Country. He took on Four because everybody loves Four. But mm -hmm. it's uh, 
there's not a lot of real like when you listen to that commentary there's not a lot of real understanding of the property there's there's some interesting understanding of the mechanics of filmmaking and isn't this interesting that this this information was put through in this amount of time in this way but i was surprised when i was listening to it to how much i thought i was listening to a high schooler who was watching star trek for the first time and i was i was re it's really shocking that the person who's in charge of this ip seems to have such a juvenile understanding of what it is. Well, and I think that's, I guess, in order to play devil's advocate, I'm going to bring up a, a few little things here. So I think that can be true for for just about anything as time goes on. When when you have an IP that you're constantly trying to generate new stories based off of, right? So you're not trying to retell the same story. It, just as a contrast, something like The Lord of the Rings, it's pretty rote. We have we have the original book. When you make the movies, you're basing it off the original book. You're following the same storyline, same characters, same same everything. So you're not really needing to come up with new things other than how to present the story to the audience. When you have something like Star Trek and you're continuing to try to push the story forward to write new stories that are associated with it, if you're not the original author, you're not the original creator of that story, it's very difficult to try to stay in line with what that original creator wanted, especially if that original creator is no longer alive. And everybody is going to have an interpretation of what they feel Star Trek or, or anything that they're doing, or anything that they're watching or writing, um, what their idea of what it should be or how they can best present the message to the audience. And I think, as, as I said, a devil's argument or a devil's advocate for this argument would be some people have this notion that with great light comes great dark. And sometimes you cannot appreciate the light without the dark. So when you have a utopian future, you have this humanist idea of everybody getting along and everybody working together to overcome these great obstacles. If you, if those obstacles aren't presented as more and more dangerous, more and more dark, bigger, bigger, bigger for the light to overcome, it kind of starts to get bland in some people's eyes. And, and I can, uh, you know, I can attest that there have been some episodes that I've watched that it's kind of, you know, this is this is everything's hunky dory, everybody's getting along, everything's fun. And it's, it's not necessarily captivating. But when you start to see some darker elements, when you start to see, hey, there's a real threat out there, and that threat could overcome us, or even internal fighting, on one side, it starts to make the story a little bit more interesting for some folks. And I think that just has to do with a changing audience and has to do with with uh, changing perceptions on what the future could be, could have anything to do with political climate, economic climate. I mean, this is something that's been going on for over 50 years now. So times change. Well, sure. And there are a couple a couple of things to that. I should have taken brought a notepad with me. Um, so Yes, it's true. It gets harder as you go along, but you need writers who appreciate what the property is and respect and understand it. That's where that that gets taken away. The the trouble is is not that Star Trek is too long. The trouble is is that my the arguments that have been made here are, are about the people who are who are taking it now are doing it in such a way that's so vastly different to what it was. And this is sort of the same piece I have with Star Wars. Is I don't deny that there's good storytelling mechanics in doing something other than Star Trek and not having utopian future. Go do your own IP. Go do another science fiction film or another science fiction IP that's like the, uh, it's like the Expanse that is a little bit darker. But if you're coming into someone else's house and you're playing with someone else's toys, you need to respect their rules. If you can't do that, then you need to find someone who can because it's not impossible. It just takes skill. Well, I guess my I would point to Cobra Kai as an example to that of how you can have people who were completely disconnected from the original show, had no connection whatsoever, but they respected it and they understood it. And I would argue they've been able to put forward content that's even better than what the original people did. And and I definitely will agree to that. Um, I, I think I, I'm not saying that everything that they've done moving forward has been perfect or that it's been you know, outstanding. Even I think there's always ways that they could have improved and told the stories better and brought a little bit more of the original intent behind Star Trek that Gene Roddenberry had. Um, but I think it's because uh, I've heard this argument before where it's like, you know, similar to you go into somebody's house and play with their toys, you need to respect what they were originally intended for. Mm -hmm. But in the case of something like Star Trek, that so many people hold dear, and they have their own perceptions on who's to say who the owners of the toys actually are anymore. 
I mean, I think the owners of the toys are the community that's around it and the established or, you know what I mean? If you're, uh, you know, again, if you want to do something that's not Star Trek, that's fine. I'm not saying you can't tell dark sci-fi, but don't misuse this IP. Um, and if you're going to do it in Star Trek, you better be, you better know the rules before you can break them. And, you know, you can't be some TV show writer who's come off of the WB and come into Star Trek and think that you're going to throw Michael Burnham in and some teen melodrama and that you've cracked the code as to what this franchise is missing. Uh, you know, it's a lot more complicated than that. And particularly talking about Discovery, there just isn't as much, doesn't seem to me to be as much thought. I mean, you watch Discovery season, particularly I'll go with season two. I can't, I mean, there's no even getting into season three, but I'll go with season two because I think that's the fair enough, like, Anson Mount and that storyline is kind of the closest to what Star Trek would be if it were reimagined in sort of the Akiva Goldsman, Alex Kurtzman mentality. And I just, even there, it's it's so simplistic and it's so predictable. And there's nothing, the, the great thing, at least I would say for the original series, is that when I watch The Twilight Zone, I almost always know how the episode is going to end even if i've never seen it before because the writing is good but it's not that good that i can't see it coming when you watch tos almost every one of those resolutions is like oh my gosh i never would have thought of this and this is perfectly consistent with how these characters would act in this situation and it's not asking me as the audience to accept things that are sort of beneath me or above me it's perfectly in line with what i've been presented and when i watch discovery i just don't see any of that thought i see emotion and when you listen to the interviews of the creators and when you listen i mean i can't tell you how many interviews with alex kurtz when i've watched and it just shocks me the words that he uses and the way he describes you know we want to have feelings we want to have emotions and it's like yeah but you have to have thought you have to have something more concrete something deeper than just to isn't that through. sad and I don't, I, I don't, and I, I mean, I don't know if anybody watched the Star Trek Day, the thing that CBS did uh, earlier. I think it was in September, where they had every show. They did reunions. It was all live streams, and every one of those panels that they, I mean, it, it was hours and hours of live streams and interviews with the old cast and the new cast, and not once did the secret hideout production team mention Gene Roddenberry, and not once did they mention the legacy. It was all. We're going to use this as a message. We're going to use this to push to push the agenda and we're going to fight for social justice. And it was it was all about messaging and it was all about using the platform as a message. And none of it was about we're going to take these good characters and we're going to make compelling stories with them. And it's I think the fact that they it seems to me that they think that if you have a message that is a certain way, if you have a message that you like in the show. That makes it a good show, and it doesn't matter how easily it was for you to get to there, how how contrived the plot points are, how underdeveloped the characters are. As long as your messaging is good, that means the show is good. And I, I, it seems to me that I don't. It seems to me that these writers maybe don't understand that you have to put a little bit more in to your characters into your writing in order for it to be considered well done. I think with you know with without even having to go in, into any more of this deeply this just shows to me and it's a good segue into our next topic how popular the show has become because I, I i personally i mean i've and that's why i'm not going to talk much same thing i did in star wars i i watch an episode i watch a movie and then i don't think about it later on i i, I see it one time and i don't need to go back and rewatch it i'm like yeah this is fine but it's it's whatever but there's i mean there's there's religions based off their series there's people that refer to themselves as trekkies there's it's just it's become so popular and it's just it's spread it's like it's contagious just the feeling of the show so to segue into the next question, why do you guys think that Star Trek became so popular? Um, and you can start at the beginning with the original series um, and then work your way through if you want. Or just, you know, why is it still popular 50, 60 years later? It's it's ridiculous to me. Uh, it's, it baffles me because I just personally don't get it. Um, but, Neil, I want to start with you on this one. Uh, why, why do you think so many people were drawn to the concept of this? this potential utopian society in, in space and uh, space frontier travel and things of that nature? I mean, obviously, I can't speak to those original fans in 1966, but I think it had a big appeal. I think it had a big appeal back then just because it was something so drastically different than what was already out. Um, you know, in the 60s, there was a lot of a lot of Westerns, a lot of 
uh, a lot of war stuff, but this was the really first big sci-fi space travel adventure. And I think that's what got a lot of people captivated. And then fast forward, you know, 20, 25 years later, when their kids are now of TV watching age and you got the next generation coming out, it really is the next generation of fans that are, you know, learning uh, about this uh, storyline. And I think it just got passed down from from the original fans of the original series to the the, the next generation. Yeah, similar, kind of like a similar route that Star Wars took. Gary, what about you? Well, I think that um, in the 1960s, you had um, the Cold War that was really heating up. Right. And, um, no pun intended. And the uh, the idea of Star Trek uh, appealed to a lot of people because we had the space race that was going on. And then in the, you know, the Klingons, you sort of had the uh, the communists, sure. um, the other side of the, the battle. And then you also had characters that were very compelling to watch because you had sort of the you know, Captain Picard, who was sort of uh, in between feelings and emotions, and you had uh, Spock on the uh, the thoughts, and you had mm-hmm. um, uh, Bones on, you know, the emotion of just, the scene. Just a quick segue, uh, just a quick side question. Do you think, do you think personally, just, just to Gary, do you think Picard was closer to uh, a Kirk character or a Spock character? Um, I think that Picard was probably closer to a Kirk character um, because I think I was was reading a blog the other day and they had said the opposite. So, okay. Yeah. I think that both Kirk and Picard had a desire to, to lead and to command. Sure. Um, And Spock though, never shunned it when he had to command something, but Mm -hmm. that was like, uh, I I think that they both, that Kirk and Picard were probably closer. I would say. He just always seemed like when I, when I had actually watched the original series that, you know, Kirk was the, the charismatic cowboy kind of character. Um, and I may interpret his Shatner's performance differently than other people. Um, but it just seemed like Picard was very far from that. It seemed like he was like, you know, Leonard Nimoy's interpretation on Spock was that he was just very logical and, you know, cerebral and just, well, I mean, Kirk was, uh, 32, I think when he, 35, when he became a captain, he was the youngest captain in Starfleet. Um, and, um, so when his story picks up, he's a younger man. And when Picard's story pick up, he's, he's an older guy, so mm-hmm. he's more level headed, but like, if you know, in season se- seven, uh, episode tapestry, um, you know, you see a younger captain, John Luke Picard, where he gets, you know, stabbed through the heart by a sure. Nausicaan. So okay. he's, but when we pick up with him, he's older and more mature than Kirk was. Sure. And Kirk also was in a different time gotcha. because you know, he was yeah, exactly. Yeah. He, he was like front lines battle every day where okay. Picard was more exploration diplomacy. Okay. He was a diplomat. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. All right. Fair enough. Uh, That's what I was going to say. The Federation yeah. was older. Yeah. In that time. Oh, was it you just, know? just in like the, in the universe of Star Trek, it was later on. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, Cause I know in, in some of the series, we'll get down to the breakdowns in a second, but um, some of the series were, um, before the original series, is that yeah. correct? Uh, just, uh, just Enterprise, and then Enterprise. a few uh, uh, well placed episodes well, that had time travel. And discovery. and discovery, yes, yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, so Michael, where, where, where were you at with that? Not that question, but um, why do you think that Star Trek became so popular and remained popular over the last couple of decades? Well, I think all the all the points have kind of already been said. Uh, that I would agree with. Sure. I mean, everything from what was going on in the world at the time when the original series came out, the nostalgia that slowly built up over that as you had this television series that went on for three years, four years, three, three years. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the fan base slowly began to develop, began to develop, began yeah. to develop. And you saw through the 70s and 80s as people with the movies began to come out and you saw people starting to get more tied in, more tied in and asking for more and more and more. They let that pressure build up, I think, just long enough and then at perfectly the right moment, release the next generation, mm-hmm. at which Runaway Success, I still believe, was the only series to actually win an Emmy, correct? I mean, I believe so. I know TOS didn't. Yeah. And but I, I, to that point, I would like to say, I don't know that Star Trek has persisted. Uh, I was uh, pulling up the ratings for Discovery and Picard and uh, Discovery had lost half its audience has lost half its audience since it started and got a 0.2 on the Nielsen rating, which is just awful. Yeah. And the, but, full and, disclosure, full disclosure. People don't watch 
broadcast TV the way that they did in the 90s. It's also anyway. not broadcast now that it's streaming only. This is true. But like also Star Trek Picard um, lost 45 percent of its, its audience by the finale. So I, I think Discovery is not streaming only. Discovery is broadcast. It was put on regular air last year. Right. OK. But I, so what my point is, is that people are tuning in for the nostalgia of it and then it's like they're going and they're ordering steak and they get a trout instead and they're like i didn't want this so they tune out by the the end of the show because the show has not been faithful to the intellectual property on which it's based yeah and i think that that's turning a lot of people off to star trek um in much the same way in, in a in a much more pronounced way than with star wars i think and to that real quick yeah, real quick, and I want to bring that back to a point that uh, Michael was making earlier, and I understand he's playing devil's advocate, but I, I just want to dive into this idea because it is one that is that is used a lot. Um, I would point to those that drop in ratings and say that, yes, you can say that storytelling needs to change and we need to do things a little bit differently because Star Trek has always had this optimism. Well, look what happens when they change. Nobody watches it. Nobody wants it. So I don't know how much the audience is really shifting into wanting darker storytelling. And I would further argue that um, I don't think the world gets much darker than the 1960s Cold War. Uh, I would say if you think we're in a more dangerous place now politically than we were then, then you might want to re-examine things. And so the idea that people now are more pessimistic about the political situation and therefore they want darker content, I just don't think holds up. I don't think you can get darker than Russia and the United States ready to blow each other out of the sky for 40 years. And that's not anywhere near happening now. What was happening in the 60s was the darkest of dark politics. And what people wanted was optimism. And the idea that, well, things might be darker it's a different time now. It's dangerous. And so things won't, I just don't think that's true. And I think those ratings point to that. Right. Yeah. I, I would agree to that. Um, cause people like star Trek because of its message of hope and it's Absolutely. when it has characters that are good people that may be put in difficult situations and may even do the wrong things at times. But if they learn from that and grow from that and they try to do you know, try to do the right thing in the end. Uh, people like to see a hero. They don't like to just see villains everywhere all the time. Everything's depressing. That's don't trust life. anyone. Yeah. I, Cause I, Luke, I think you said that in another episode, like if, if I want to be depressed, you know, I'll just live my life. I don't want to, I don't need TV Christmas for that. Types. Yeah. yeah that's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It's true. I mean, yeah. you know, we, we want, we pull something from these stories. We want, you know, one of the reasons I love Kirk is because I see him in situations and I think, God, I would never know how to get out of that. And then I see him come up with an answer and it's like, oh, of course, a Starfleet captain would come up with that answer. That's exactly the right answer. And that's what you should do. And I don't look at that and say, oh, gosh, I'm not as smart as Kirk. I can't relate to that. I look at that and say, oh, gosh, I could be Kirk someday if I just if I apply. My, and isn't it great that I can see the good examples of what human beings can be and I can I can not have them subverted and I cannot have to sit here and kind of be fighting with the writer as I'm watching the show. Right. And so so speaking speaking of Kirk, I do kind of want to segue for time for time constraints. I want to segue into uh, breaking down each series. Um, so, Luke, I'm going to let you take the original series because you did tell me that was one of your 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 favorite ones for sure. Um, sure. So can you give us just a, a brief synopsis of, you know, obviously episode by episode, just a brief synopsis of, you know, what happened in the three seasons? Maybe a quick rundown of a few of the characters. I'm sure this is one of the series that is most popular with the um, our listening audience and the American audience for sure. Um, but uh, yeah, go ahead, take a crack at it. Let's let's see what you got. Sure, yeah, and I'll try not to be redundant because I did kind of touch on the archetypes of the three main earlier. But yeah, you've basically got the id, the ego, and the super ego with Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. And um, it, it's you know, not only is it not only does that relationship represent the wonderful human, you know, the wonderful individual has to sort out these sort of dynamics within themselves. It also represents sort of the perfect human friendship. As I'm sure Johnny, you know this. I know that we've had people who've either been more emotional than us or more logical than us, and we sort of learn how to balance those dynamics. And 
again, the optimism in the future, that, that that is also nice. But I guess I should maybe back up a little bit. So it starts in, what is it, 2067, I believe, not talking about the cage. You know, season one, episode one, The Man Trap, I believe is 2167. But um, the future, you know, the optimism and the whole point of the Enterprise at that time, which the TOS Enterprise is obviously the best ship. I don't think anyone would reasonably argue with that. But anyway, the whole point of the Enterprise, it's, you know, it's Hornbuckler, Hornbuckler, Horatio Hornbuckler. They're supposed to go out and sort of be like the British Empire captains in the 17 and 1800s. They're sort of running their own enterprise. They are they are the governor, the king, and the emissary for the British Empire whenever the captain comes upon something else. And so they're sort of... They're these extremely independent, self-reliant, you know, people who can who are not only very smart, they're very physical. It's you know, Kirk is is sort of a bit like a James Bond. He's suave, he's intelligent, he's graceful, he can do all these different things. And uh, that's what to me was appealing about the original series was this idea of sort of, you know, Johnny, I don't know if you remember, but if you I first saw Master and Commander. I said, this is like Star Trek in the 1700s. I do recall you saying because that. Because it's yeah. basically that same thing. And it's it's that, that to me is what's interesting. But again, it's interesting in the context of let's see these best elements of humanity play themselves out in these situations that are inconceivable. Yeah. Well, when I picture William Shatner, I also picture Russell Crowe. So it makes total sense. And look, I'll say this. I and I, I think TOS fans would agree with me. I know Shatner gets a lot of, a lot of shit. I wasn't sure if I could cuss. Sorry. It's, it gets a totally lot of okay. stuff. Explicit language is but, acceptable. Um, <laughs> and I think Neil Neil was saying this earlier, but, you know, uh, particularly in the movies, in the 80s movies, oh, boy, uh, I think he's great. I think he's great in Wrath of Khan. I think I think every movie that uh, that he's in, he does really, really well. And, uh, you know, it's there's a certain dynamic you kind of have to balance with being a captain, right. you know, and, and they, they Gary, I think they talk about this in TNG where Picard, you remember when Bev, where they're on the planet and Crusher can read Picard, like their minds are linked. And so she can read his mind. Yes. Of and course. he's like, we're going to go this way. And she's like, you don't really know where we're going. And he said, yeah, but as the captain, I have to. I have to project leadership, even if I'm scared out of my, you know, even if I don't know where I'm going, I have to pretend like I do. Mm -hmm. And I always felt like you could see Shatner play, acting on two levels. Like you could see him acting as I'm the captain of the ship, but you could also see him being like, I have to put on this brave stoke. You could see Kirk acting as the captain as well as Shatner acting as Kirk. There was, you know, and I think he gets a lot of flack for maybe tj hooker and some of the stuff he did later on but as far as i'm concerned um he he takes up the scene when every shot he's in in the star trek in the original series in the original movies he's fantastic yeah i mean I, I would agree with that i mean he's uh i think probably the most famous part of uh captain kirk is in the movie star trek 2 when he, he's like oh <gasps> and i think that we had it, that on our we actually had that on our original yeah, intro reel <laughs> yeah we did um and that part i think is is quoted you know just as like a really you know crazy amount of emotion to put into that but if you actually watch the scene it plays out well and perfect I'm, sense yeah i don't i don't think that he that jumps uh un unbelievably from the previous part of the scene yeah i mean i i mean they must be, they must have been doing something right because he leonard nimoy george takai like that entire group i mean these guys are still recognizable to you know people from the ages of 15 all the way up to 60 70 something you know and we're we're 50 years later so mm. well, what's, what's interesting right. is the original series was actually canceled because of low ratings and really then, yeah, oh, i didn't know that yeah, it was only well low low ish low relative well, to what low and, enough, gene enough. was also <laughs> And Gene was getting in trouble. He did. He wasn't uh -huh. getting along with the network people. He was pushed out on season three. That, that's why produ so producers I'm, need to be pushed out of every major fucking decision yeah, when it comes to film. I think we can all agree on that. Hollywood but, is just yeah, saturated. That's, with that's why you see kind of like the the production values drop tremendously, especially in the latter half of the third season. And it wasn't until they went into syndication think, yeah. uh, in the seventies okay. that that really started to find its audience. And then you started to have the Trek conventions. This was something I you know, a point I wanted to get to earlier, but I didn't about why is it held up. You know, I think this is going to sound silly, but I really think one of the reasons the original series is held up is because of the color palette. Um, I don't know if you guys know who Herb Solo is, but he was one of the producers on, you know, on the original series and stuff like that. But he's written a book 
about, you know, he was in the meetings with NBC when they rejected the cage. And he talks about how, like, no, they didn't care that uh, we had a black female lead. They didn't like the fact that it was Gene's girlfriend who was the lead. <laughs> and, you know, he's he's written a lot of stuff about sort of the truth about the production behind Star Trek. Uh, was that he specifically told the costume designers and the set designers make this colorful because this is going to be one of the first shows that's going to be on color TV and we want to make sure that we use it. And in fact, they were advertising Star Trek in full color. If you remember those old NBC in color where the peacock would come out, if you watch any of the old episodes, (laughs) they have that at the end. And I think one of the reasons in the seventies it took off was because it looked so different right? and it really stood out to people. And Mm -hmm. when you're a kid, particularly you really remember that. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong. The original series was the first series to have, have an interracial kiss on screen is that correct that's what they say that? that's, that's what they say yeah, interracial yeah. kiss on uh on screen on screen yeah yeah i thought that was the it's it, it certainly paved it certainly paved the way not only for the entire series but the sci-fi genre in particular you know for it becoming tv series and then becoming even more popular in in film um so let's jump it's just it's just for time i do have to keep these short so gary i want to jump over to next generation really quick um why don't you go ahead and give us a brief rundown and a synopsis on that series that was uh, the next one all uh, right well the next generation uh uh ran um uh from uh 87 to uh 94 Damn, that's, that's just one that's one long just lapse of just nothing I mean, there were two, two decades, right? Time. I mean, that's, yeah. that's well, a well, they, long they, time to not have. They made a bunch of movies in between. They did. Oh, they did. Yeah. That's right. That's, uh, that's and right. they had that's the right. animated series. And the animated <laughs> series. That's, that's, wasn't that on like one year or something, though? It was like one season. One year, but it was. Two seasons. Two seasons. Uh, 24 okay. episodes, I think. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, so Next Generation uh, follows a, a new cast and crew on a new ship bearing the same name. Uh, plenty of letters left in the alphabet. Um, and you have Captain Picard and I, I uh, Captain Picard and uh, it's it's Gene Roddenberry is also in, at the helm of this show and um, you can kind of you see his influence and you especially on some of the episodes like and some of the characters like Q I think is a very Gene Roddenberry ish character because it's an all powerful uh, entity that can pretty much do whatever they want and that is that to me screams Gene Roddenberry. And uh, this was the first show that I saw. And I think probably a lot of people our age, this was the first introduction to Star Trek. And it was just, it was a really interesting show, especially uh, season three. They really kicked up the budget and the special effects uh, looked a lot better. Um, And they even still hold up today in a lot of ways, I think, uh, because they used uh, real models for uh, the enterprise. And I I think in uh, deep space nine, they went to CGI for that. Um, but you know, and it just follows their, uh, adventures around the galaxy and what they're doing. And you kind of, since it's a longer series, you get more of a chance to see each of the characters and what they're doing and get to know them a little bit better. And, uh, they had lots of stories that would come back to earlier stories. So, uh, spoiler alert, um, the, uh, in the first episode, uh, Q, which is this entity, uh, start, you know, puts Picard and humanity on trial to see if they're worthy of being a species in the in the galaxy. And the final episode of the series concludes that trial. And it's just it's oh, just a really neat. nice okay. little book into it. It's a clever way to do it. Yeah. Um, and like there's lots of stories like that. Some of them pan out better than others, like uh the data and the lore season six, seven <laughs> two parter was uh, maybe not as strong, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's a series that really hit its stride in seasons three, four and five. Would you guys say that just collectively really quick? Uh, would you guys say that th- it may not be your favorite series necessarily, but out of all of them, would this one probably be have the most success, the most popularity, not with the films, just as a run? I mean, it, it went the it ran the longest amount. It went what seven eight seasons, right? Seven, Playing yeah. The highest seven. billing, yeah, yeah, highest billing. Um, and I mean, I know that normally it seems like the captains always get really all of the all of the notice. Um, with the exception of original series, you see people know who Takai and, and Nimoy are. Um, but you've still got. I mean, I guess I don't know if was Lavar Burton really popular. In this one outside, I mean, he had Reading Rainbow, you know, around this time, too. He, he did Roots in the 70s. And it he was a big too. character. He, he was. was definitely and a then big character. People still remember Jonathan Franks, I would say. Franks. Fra- uh, Frank, maybe not me. remember yeah. Jonathan Franks. Franks. Yeah. <laughs> right. I don't know who Jonathan Franks is. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to be Franks with you, Johnny. 
Yeah. Freaks, but yeah, to answer Johnny's <laughs> question, I do think Next Generation was marketed the best just because I think they had the best ensemble of a cast. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think you can just see by how many yeah. spinoffs it had. It had uh, two immediate spinoffs exactly. and then yeah. kind of carried, okay. carried it through to the mid-2000s with uh, Enterprise. Gotcha. Okay. Well, right. one thing about that was uh, Rick Berman and I think Brendan Braga – he was for sure on Enterprise, but I think he was on Voyager too. Mike, you might be able to correct me on that. Uh, but on all of those, on DS9, on Voyager, and Enterprise, uh, Rick Berman had told – who was it CBS at the time under Les Moon? I think it was CBS, right, and Les Moonves in the early 2000s, even in the late nights. He said, look, give us a year or two so we can flush these concepts out, so we can give the audience a break, and so we can really dive in. And the network said, no, we want this running ASAP, and in some cases concurrently. And the reason was advertising. Star Trek pulls in X amount of dollars for advertising, and we can't have a time slot that doesn't have Star Trek in it. So whatever it takes, we need to make sure that we can build Star Trek in this time slot, or we can build Star Trek on this day. So get the show up and running as quick as you can. And I would say, look, part of that is a testament to how well Rick Berman ran the franchise after Gene. We're still here talking about all of these because, you know, you may not like everything he did, but he obviously knew what he was doing. So what's what's different between Next Generation and the original series? What what from from its core? Boy, I mean, like what a what, fun question. Yeah, from its core. That'll what the rest of the podcast? Yeah. Is. <laughs> Just I want I want one sentence from everybody. One, maybe two. Okay, what do you think, Kirk? What do you think was different? <laughs> okay, the captains. Okay, I, I guess I meant like um, you, you said in the first one, the, the original series. It was more of a introduction and a journal the, series. I, mm-hmm. I would say that the next generation more of a trifecta. Okay, I would say that the next generation was more of a grounded show, like a okay. more realistic show, right? Because, like you said, it 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 follows the captain a lot of the times. You know, it typically centers around the cap, the crew too. But the captain, you said that Picard was more of a diplomat. Kirk was more of, uh, I guess, a cowboy. Cowboy, yeah. Well, a cowboy, I mean, he I gets guess, that reputation, know? but I mean, that's I think mainly from the movies. Like, if you watch like the original series, okay. He, no, he's he's he's, still, he's, he's ex- pretty wild in the original he series. He gives book. those guys. He 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 does. There's definitely stuff he does in the original series. I mean, what is it? Our little uh, this little private war. Um, I mean, that's that's not protocol. That entire attitude is not protocol. But he did what he thought he had to do. And so, I do agree with you. Kirk gets a reputation for being more of a cowboy than he was, but he's certainly more of a cowboy than Picard. I would agree to that. <laughs> All right, let's let's move on. Uh, Deep Space Nine, Gary. I know how much you love Deep Space Nine, yeah. and you're the only one. Looking forward to, to this because you're only the one, the only one brave enough to take this one on. Because I don't know if anybody in this group actually likes that series. Okay, so but let's 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 give it a shake. This goes great. Yeah. So what's really great about Star Trek is the the chance to to explore, to find strange new worlds and new civilizations, and to just go where no. <laughs> one has gone before and what's awesome with uh deep space nine is you don't do any of that you just sit on a star base um and like kind of hear stories of cool things that are going on Pretty sweet and, did yeah. they i never really watched deep have space some nine. weird Such bartender a, that yells at you yeah <laughs> did they and re- a hologram did they, who played mr house did yeah. they re- did they reenact those flashbacks at least when they were telling the stories no, no. The, the, it no. was just dialogue. It no, was just it, someone standing there giving like a complete monologue <laughs> about uh, what story uh, that happened. Yeah, I, I mean, so deep, so boring. Deep Space Nine was the first uh, Star Trek show that began not under the command of gene roddenberry so you okay. kind of see s- yeah. some yeah. different things kind of going on like the the um he starts off as a commander but cisco uh is not like kirk or picard at all he's, he's a much he hates he hates picard in the beginning yeah there yeah picard does a special guest spot in the first episode um because cisco's much more of a He's a, a free spirit. We'll call him that, I guess. Okay. Uh, so every it's it's nice to hear that every captain is different from the one before. I oh yeah. That. yeah, I appreciate There's that definitely. in the writing. Um, and uh, like <laughs> D- Deep Space Nine, I think uh, continued to try and 
tackle darker tones than um, the original series or the next generation did in a lot of ways. Uh, there's this one, it's a pretty graphic scene actually, where this guy hangs himself in uh, the foyer what? of Deep Space Nine. Like Damn. he's just hanging, like he's hung himself. He's a dead person hanging. And it's just, that's a really odd like you wouldn't have seen that in the original series or the next generation at all um right. in the original series they they did tackle a lot of um heavy things like there's this episode called conscience of the king um in which oh, yes. um a guy that used to be the governor of a planet he killed half the planet in order to save the other half and so he's been Thanos on the run was up and uh Kirk thinks he bumps into him later, but he's not sure if it's him. Okay. And so there's the whole mystery. Um, and at the end of that episode, it turns out it is him. This was <laughs> 60 years ago. So spoiler alert. Um, and like his daughter has gone crazy and so kills the father. Like it's like, but anyway, Deep Space Nine is what we're talking about. Yes. Yeah, Deep okay. Space Nine is, is, the, is the current time. <laughs> oh, no, TOS is great. Um, <laughs> TOS is fantastic. Let's talk and, about that again. And uh, so, so Deep Space Nine kind of shows life aboard a, uh, a space dock um, outside of uh, Bajor and uh, <laughs> the things that go on there. And then the last, um, you know, they have uh, some guests, some, some stars move over from uh, next generation like Cole Meany and uh, Michael Dorn mm -hmm. um, and then the sort of the, it concludes with a uh, interstellar war uh, with the Dominion War um, very Star Wars I think you were you were making fun of earlier if they were or Michael was saying yeah, earlier it, it was kind it, of like it, and it, even if you watch like the Dominion War episodes from Deep Space Nine mm -hmm. they look like uh, just a boring nothing compared to just any of the shots from like Picard or Discovery. Like it's yeah. it's just, and I'm not saying that Picard or Discovery are better. It's just like, there's just so much. The screen is so dense. <laughs> Shut up. There's so many Shut things. Up. Every shot has so much going on. It's so every frame. Uh, so can I ask you something, Gary? Cause I, I, I hear, I know a lot of people who swear by DS9, who, who really who tell me that like DS9 wow. is is the it's not appreciated and that it basically does what Discovery is trying to do. It handles these darker tones in a way that's still Star Trek, but also is consistent with being a little bit of a darker show. Um, I I like Cisco. Um, but I can't get past how boring staying in one place and these weird characters that they've introduced in the first episode of DS9 is. So, like, you were talking to me as as someone who, you know, who goes hard over TOS and the TOS movies, which, you know, I think Neil was saying this earlier, the TOS movies really kind of are what brought that early friend was those movies were so good that they even made the show better. But if I'm coming from that side of it, what should I be? What should I be looking for in DS Nine, and what should I? What are things that I should be like? Oh, you know, I, this is going to seem weird, but just look over that. Maybe watch this episode and this episode because there's just so much different in DS Nine. It's just it's so hard for me to keep going. Kind of the same with Voyager, but I like Janeway and I like the idea of the back to traveling around. But DS Nine is so Babylon Five that it's kind of hard for me to get on board. So so you know, no pun coach me a little bit here, if you would. Yeah, I mean DS Nine, uh, they definitely moved away from the the mold in terms of we have a ship that goes out and explores, and it's the the vast bulk of the show is taking place in in one immobile station. And so that really sets a different tone for the show because instead of explorers or diplomats or uh, combatants, they're more administrators on uh, the star base. So it, it, it has a different feel to it. And it, it because of that, it, it, they are able to explore um, different concepts uh, from a new angle in terms of like, you know, how do you settle space? How do you, you know, uh, if you're putting yourself in the middle of a situation between uh, the Bajorans and the Cardassians um, that are two groups that don't like each other, how do you mediate that? Which I think um, going back to Johnny's discussion earlier, uh, each Star Trek is sort of a, a product of its time. So by the mid nineties, when deep space nine came around, uh, the United States didn't have a cold war to fight. Cold Wars. So we were more like, how do we mediate between peoples that hate each other? So I think maybe that's where the inspiration for that came from, but I don't think that it 
there's yeah it, there, there's no trek in the star trek deep space nine it's if it was just huh. star stop or star uh, station area. yeah star station number <laughs> right, 602 right. <laughs> Right, right, yeah. So it certainly it certainly sounds like uh, the most, uh, you know, boring. Yeah, well, the I'm, slowest. I mean, I mean, they do try to make it up with the Dominion War, and and they do have plots and things that happen in it. Uh, so I'm not saying that it's the worst Star Trek. Cisco's a great character too. Sorry, Greg. well, Cisco, I get excited. Yeah, Cisco's a very interesting and different character. Um, and I think the I can't remember the guy that played him, Avery Brooks. Um, uh, Avery. Yeah, I, he's he's a very interesting human being. Um, and uh, he, <laughs> he's the only dude who's about as weird as Shatner when they when they interview each other. <laughs> and he he infused that character with some very interesting uh, elements to it. So I, I don't want to say that it's bad it's just not in keeping with i think that feeling of exploration and adventure and um i hate to say discovery that uh, star trek had <laughs> right and one of the one of the interesting things about deep space nine and because uh, you talk about that there's no longer a trek to it there's no longer a voyage we're kind of on this space station but the interesting thing that deep space nine did or that it attempted to tackle was it kind of flushed out talk about from the alpha quadrant mm -hmm. a little bit it talked about some of the internal politics within the federation talked about the introduction of the dominion uh from the beta quadrant talked about how the romulans were involved in stuff through the tal shiar and how they were trying to manipulate things to be in their advantage the the relationship between the klingon empire and the federation how that was beginning to to strain and and go back and forth and how the tal shiar were involved in it and how occupation of bajor and i mean there's a million different things that they attempted to cover uh, within the seven seasons that Deep Space Nine was there, but it kind of harkens back to when you talked about in a Star Wars movie, it's not great to have these long Senate scenes where they're just drawn out talking about legislation. This is kind of the equivalent of that in Star Trek, but to the nth degree, because it's just this kind of political game and not everybody's going to be super interested in that. They like that exploration, the new ideas, the new species, the new planets, all the new stuff that you get and the ability to do storytelling based off of that. But when you kind of turn internally and start to look for stories there, it's just a different ride. And um, whether it's good or whether it's bad, I'll say it's just different. And I think well, that, do you think uh, I think that also with uh, the original series and Next Generation and Enterprise and Voyager, you had a chance to have each episode be very modular like it was most of the time they were just contained within themselves there were some storylines that carry through it had uh you know repercussions later but by and large you know every new episode was uh, a new scenario they were in and they got to kind of see you know how they reacted with deep space nine it was much more i think of just one long continuous uh drama so it wasn't like a an episodic drama it was just you know what you might see, you know, in, you know, a, a long movie with one storyline. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so moving on from deep space nine, uh, Michael, I wanted to jump over to Voyager really quick. Um, can you give us a little, give us a little rundown there. It looks like a lot of these, a lot of these between, between that deep space nine and, uh, the end of next generation, they were all kind of, kind of intertwining a little bit. They were all kind of, they were like, they started, towards the end of one and started around the same time and so i don't know i've like i said i've never really watched these ones did those stories ever connect at all like would they ever connect like episode three for uh, next generation shared a time with voyager and episode five or i don't know was that a thing or were they separate worlds right not in the not in the traditional sense like you would think of like for instance how the marvel movies all have kind of that connective tissue right. yeah, exactly. together how exactly one affects I mean. the other and they reference one in in the other that may happen to a certain degree uh within voyager within deep space nine how they kind of talk about these things but it's not as connected as some other gotcha. stories okay. are um for instance the the opening of star trek voyager uh takes place at deep space nine when they first get started okay um so that it does have that where you've got uh ensign kim uh, who's on who's uh interacting with quark at his bar mm -hmm. where he's trying to get sold stuff by the ferengi as a scam uh -huh. i mean just just kind of how it introduces what a, a few characters yeah exactly <laughs> introduces a few characters that way um but voyager uh started in 95 ran until 2001 um was the first series that 
prominently showed a female captain. Okay. So that was kind of its, this was Janeway, its claim to fame. Yes, right. that okay. was Catherine right. Janeway. Gotcha. Um, originally, Kate Mulgrew did not have the slot <laughs> as a uh, Janeway, but the original, right. but the original actress that they hired, I'm trying to think of her last name, but she was a uh, Canadian. Uh -huh. She quit a day and a half into production because they wow. realized, and she realized very quickly that the demands of filming that TV show, she was not going to be able to meet them. Okay. Because when you, when you hear the interviews of folks who have been, especially on next generation Voyager, all those we're talking 16, 18 hour work days right. that these folks are going through to try and meet, uh, Weekly to meet their episodes, deadlines. Right. And it's just not something that she was going to be able to, to hold up to. True. And there are, you know, there are scenes out there that were able to, to be released where she was actually reading the lines and she was on, uh, on set you know, actually being filmed. And it's kind of an interesting little thing, but uh, more to the point, Voyager, a uh, story about a science vessel named Voyager, intrepid mm -hmm. class starship that got lost in the Delta Quadrant. Uh, episode one, Caretaker, two-parter, they get transported to the Delta Quadrant and suddenly they're 70,000 light years away from home. So oh, they're they're facing this journey across completely unknown regions of space that they have no idea what's out there. And when it starts out, it's the idea of what's going to hold this together, mm -hmm. because not only do they have their own crew that they have on board, but they also have another group that's called the Maquis, or at least a group of them uh, that's going to be on board with them as well. So basically the equivalent of like terrorists that okay. the Federation would see or criminals. Sure and just happened to meld them together and then move forward from there. And Voyager took that same idea that Deep Space Nine had of turning things a little bit darker uh, and moving forward with their still having kind of that morality idea behind it of what's right, what's wrong, what would you do in this situation, mm -hmm. um, and started to take it to the nth degree. That's okay. Voyager is when it really, you, you see those wheels start churning forward. And to be honest, I think a lot of what that has to do with in Voyager is because I think Voyager over the course of its seven seasons had, was it five or six showrunners? Wow. Um, and each showrunner only lasted a handful of years. So you, while there's connective tissue between all of the, all of the seasons, you can really see the, the, the show change. From, yeah. from season to season to season. It's, yeah, I'm surprised that they ran for that long with that many showrunners because a yeah. lot of, I mean, just as us being regular everyday viewers of any type of content, you know, a big, big concern is storyline being interrupted at some point, you know, or, you know, just these, these, these jagged um, character arcs and stuff that are never completed. You know, they just kind of fall off. So you never saw that. Right. Watching watching it. I'm sure. You, how many times have you seen the series all the way through? Would you say <laughs> I, I've seen Voyager many times? OK, <laughs> many okay. times all the way through, <laughs> though, uh, there are still times when I am surprised the uh, things that I either forgot or or didn't even know existed. <laughs> Was there anything in particular that you may have forgotten? No, Gary, I don't know what oh, you're talking tell, about. Yes. Oh, I feel like there's a story there. There's I... a story there. And there's an episode. What's your of last Voyager. gem? What's the last gem? <laughs> there's an episode of Voyager, and I'm trying to remember which season it was in. I want to say it was season two. But ultimately, there uh, Gary and I were having this conversation where he was kind of poking fun at Voyager and my like of it. And he <laughs> he made the comment. Um, Oh, you mean when Janeway completely threw science out the window and decided she was a religious figure? <laughs> and Man, I was like, Gary. Gary, what are you talking about? And he said, there's there's an episode where she at the end of it, she's completely talking about how, well, I don't have any evidence of this, but you're saying it. So it must be true. So therefore, I believe in faith now over science. And I, I would have swore that he was completely making it up. Mm hmm. Until he pulled out his phone and pulled up YouTube and pulled out season three, episode five, False Prophets of Voyager <laughs> and showed me these scenes. And I mean, it is it was like it was completely wiped from my memory. I had no idea that that even Selective existed. Memory. Yes. And, and, I, and I think it was because it was so not a, I don't know if jarring is didn't the right catch word. It, so it didn't mean anything. Exactly. Like, I guess I just kind of skimmed that one over. Um, but I will say this about Janeway. So the same person who told me for years that, I, hey, man, you should watch Star Trek. Uh, he does not like uh, Janeway. Mm -hmm. And his argument is, is that there's no consistency in Janeway. She does. She behaves logically one minute. And then in the next episode, she'll do the most irrational things for principles. And then she'll compromise principles. Now, again, I haven't messed with Voyager at all. So I don't know. But what Gary just pointed out sounds like exactly the complaint that my friend Scott had been complaining was that it almost the almost the Michael Burnham problem was that the focus was so 
much on Janeway has to be right all the time that it broke with consistency. Gary, is that true? And Mike, do you think, do you see that now? Do, or do you think that that's just a misguided take on the character? I think that they had opportunities to perhaps delve a bit in, more into her character. Like there's an episode called Tuvix in which Neelix and <laughs> Tuvok. Uh, which, I know that one. Yeah, which they're joined together into one being. Um, and he he's a capable person and he's like, the, he he's just the combination of both of them from a transporter accident and he's like it's a really uh interesting episode because in it like he's capable of doing what both of those previous uh crew members were doing uh but janeway wants to have her original crew back <clears throat> And so she gets the doctor to figure out how to undo that. And the doctor's like, I won't do this because it's going to kill this guy. Um, and the guy's like, I don't want to die. And so Janeway basically uh, pushes him, uh, keeps him down on the, uh, the, the medical device and like splits him into two, uh, the two original crew members and like murders this man. And then they never talk about that ever again in the whole show. And, you know, that's, I think, a, a pretty horrendous thing to do. Um, and I, I think they could have had some interesting, like a mutiny or like put her in the brig or, you know, had her have some reaction to just straight up murdering a guy. But, you know, they missed out on that, Michael. <laughs> good, good job, Gary. So I, I think well it's said. I think it's right, Mike. I do think it's fun that you describe it as her holding him down on the medical table while they're making the or, uh performing this operation to split them in two which is Mike get him which is not how that happened by the way he was literally just sitting on the medical bed and she acted at gunpoint it. yeah um yes yeah, so it, it definitely was coerced and there, there's the debate back and forth whether <laughs> whether that was something that she should have actually done or not but w what I will say is that earlier uh, I think Lucas had mentioned the incident with Kirk when he said, you know, I have to project this idea of being a strong leader, whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong, I still have to be oh, the leader. Yeah, both of them, but yeah. And like, I, I have to I have to follow what I believe to be true. Uh, whether that's right or whether that's wrong is anybody's, you know, it's up for debate. Ultimately, yes, she did murder that man. Like, she did murder. And I think a lot of that also has to come down with the the writers as well. I think there was a better way, looking back on it, if if I was trying to save Janeway's character in this situation, ultimately, instead of her saying, hey, this is what's going to happen, I'm, you know, you're going to do this and I'm going to force it to happen, it should have been, hey, we have the ability to split you in two now. We were trying at first, wasn't going to work. You've had a bit of time, but you're you're now a sentient being. You're alive. I have no right to tell you to undergo this operation. But I do think you have to make a choice whether you want to do this or not. It, it's up to you. But here's what's happening. Hmm. Have two Vicks, you know, go and, and reflect on it a while, meet with a couple of members of the crew, maybe... Uh, Go to, you know, see some of Neelix's stuff, go to uh, Tuvok's quarter, see some of his stuff, learn about his family, and then come to the conclusion himself of, OK, yes, they, they should go back. I want these two people to live. I want their lives to continue. And I think that would have saved uh, some of Janeway's character at that point. I think a lot of that comes down to the, the showrunners and the writers themselves. But I will so say. Then... Sorry, go ahead. All right, go ahead. Oh, I was, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Right. What I was going to say is that ultimately she does make the decision as the captain. This is what I'm going to do. You know, none of the crew is going to follow her orders because it is murder. It is straight up murder. <laughs> um, and it goes against pretty much everything they believe in. But uh, one thing that people don't really talk about is that after she performs the procedure and they are split back into two, Janeway leaves the sick bay by herself. And she's kind of walking down the hallway away from sick bay and you see her slow down, stop. And she's basically doing a thousand yard stare where she's I there, there's a lot of unspoken dialogue that's going on there. And I, I think at least in my opinion, she's realizing that this wasn't the greatest thing to do. I hate that I was in this situation, but ultimately I need my tactical officer back. I need my morale officer back um this was a decision i made i did it i have to stick with it and just keep moving forward um i don't think she was happy or found joy in doing it 
No. So taking her position on the Tuvok situation aside, the question was, is her character consistent throughout the series? And so we don't want to go too far on how we can interpret this one scene. Right. But bringing it all together, it seemed like the argument that Gary was making was consistent with the criticism that I've heard was that, no, the character isn't consistent. She's essentially Ray in some ways where she meets whatever needs the certain episode has for her. And there's not necessarily consistent principle. Is that or is that not case in your mind? In my mind, I think it I think it's more apparent in Voyager than it is in any other series that the magical word compensate will fix just about anything that's going on in Star Trek at any given time. And just like how Picard would say, make it so I oftentimes think Janeway's version is compensate <laughs> because it seemed like she was saying it every episode, to every other episode. Um, but one thing that I will say that's consistent about Janeway is that she did try to do what she felt was the right thing. And ultimately her goal was to try to get her crew home and as many of them alive as she possibly could. Did she always make the right decision? No. Uh, I think that's easily debatable that there's no way that she made the, the right decision all the time. But I do think that she stays consistent of I'm the captain. I've got to be the leader. I've got to do this. And one thing that I like to keep in mind with Janeway is that some of the other captains that you see actually had command experience under their belt before getting the chair that they were in, at least to my knowledge. Uh, Janeway, this was her first uh, captain seat. This was her first time out. Before that, she had been, uh, I think it was the, one of the science officers on the Albatani, but um, th this was her first go at it. And she was thrown into a situation uh, 70,000 light years across the galaxy where she did not have backup. There was no one that she could turn to to say, hey, I need advice other than her crew. And being the captain... No captain probably ever has been in that situation, right? I mean, that's... Right. Who, I mean, who it's, would know? Ultimately, it's 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 like an odyssey. It's just harkening back to the, ah, to the yeah, great tale. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And when you have a command structure like that, and you can pull advice from your, uh, you know, from your first officer, you can pull advice from your senior staff, you can try to try to get as much information as you can before you make a decision. But you don't have an admiral to call up, you don't have other captains to mm -hmm. call up, you don't have anybody there to to help you make that decision other than yourself. And I think that would be difficult for anybody who was moving into a command position like that, especially their first go out. Um, so the, I, yeah, but all that aside, all that aside, how do you just like, in the first episode or two episodes, just allow the the McKee to be like half of your your officers on the bridge. Like that blows my mind that Chakotay is all of a sudden her first officer. Um, what's her name? Uh, Torres. Mm -hmm. uh, she becomes like the chief engineer. Uh, Tom Paris. He was kicked out of the Starfleet, and now she's like, oh yeah, here you're my top pilot. Like I just don't understand that. Right. And again, I, th I think you could debate the decisions all day long. Um, if I was stuck in that situation, I've got two crews that I've tried to meld together and I'm going to try to avoid a mutiny from half of this crew. I'm probably going to try and make these people as happy as I possibly can. And if that means trying to integrate them into the command structure and work together, as opposed to saying, no, you work for us and allowing that breeding ground to exist for uh, for folks to to start to to mutiny against you and take over your ship, I think that's possibly a way to do it. It's a diplomatic way of saying, hey, you know, the thing that binds us together is that we're, we're all from the Alpha Quadrant. We're all trying to get home. So we've got to work together. I'm going to extend the olive branch by showing trust. You know, your former captain is now my first officer. I still have command over him, but I'm giving him the second most, you know, second most senior position on the ship. And we're going to have to try to work together as a crew. Um, of all of the bad decisions, really bad decisions that Catherine Jane White made, uh, I don't think integrating the crew uh, was necessarily a bad idea and giving them the command positions that she did. I, I kind of <clears throat> liken it to after the end of the American Civil War, when we were trying to figure out what exactly do, do we do with the, Feder uh, the former Confederates, you know, these people who half the country sees as traitors, that, you know, they, they could still pose a threat. What do we do? And we as... as you know, the United States reached that olive branch out and said, we're all in this together, that we have to work together. We have to come together because ultimately we are we're in it alone and this is us. 
God, so that, that's kind such, of how I such dark it. topics with that. I feel like this is something that Deep Space Nine should have covered just from what you how you guys were talking about it last time. <laughs> um, so an, so another world that I want to get into um, is is Enterprise. So let's jump to that one really quick. Luke, oh, Luke, I want you to take this one. I want to hear about all the glory of Scott Bakula and a bunch of other actors that I don't know who they are. Scotty boy. <laughs> the, you know what? Isn't that here. just a joy? <laughs> I hear that long. song and I think, all right, Captain Scott on the way. He's going to save us. <laughs> um, gosh, what do you say about Enterprise? I don't know. Um, what do you say? I don't say? know. It's almost okay. So, um, came at Enterprise, you know, in this Star Trek saga that in my deep dive of of quarantine star trek and watching like gary said you sure can get through tng in a couple of days because i did it and it's tough and you see like oh boy that was a miss but you also see like oh wow what a hit that was and so coming up on enterprise i took enterprise and i sort of and this i don't remember who it was but somebody earlier made the point about you don't appreciate the light without the dark michael said and i that think earlier, that yeah. particularly applies to enterprise because i came out enterprise when i first heard about star trek discovery and i said they're making a prequel to the original series and i thought wait didn't they do that already because i remembered enterprise when i was in high school was like and there's like oh it's the kirk before the kirk and i was like fuck i don't give a fuck whatever <laughs> and so when they were talking about it under secret hideout i was like whatever didn't you just do that isn't that the same show and so when i started going through it and i learned like oh, okay this is a different production company 25 percent different licensing ownership all that shit i went through to enterprise thinking like okay so this is essentially gene roddenberry take on pre pre star trek and the idea originally and this uh, this is not quite how the show ended up the idea originally was like chuck yeager is who are the chuck yeagers of the post um the post TNG movies, first con of the post post first contact world. And what was it like to be the first guy to do, you know, warp one, warp two, warp four? What was it like? What were the political relationships like when the Vulcans first came on? And I love just divergently, I love in season four that scene when they're at the Vulcan uh, embassy and they're talking about, you know, why do Vulcans hate humans and why are Vulcans so afraid? And they say, you know, you've got the temperament of the Andorians, you've got the, pro the you've got the logic of Vulcans, and then there's, you know, we just don't know what to make of humans. And I think the divergently very quickly, I love the way that they developed the relationship between the humans and the Vulcans, and that the Vulcans had originally been like sort of like angels, as that they were these sort of guiding logical forces on the human society that had come around and it been a good thing and humans and Vulcans had always got along in the TOS timeline and in the enterprise timeline, there's this tension, but the tension makes sense because, you know, the, because the prime directive makes sense and the Vulcans are sitting there thinking like, okay, well, we can't help the humans too much because if we do, then we hold some moral culpability for, you know, if we give them nuclear technology and then they kill some species somewhere like we in some way are morally culpable for that and it's that's such an interest you know that's why the prime directive is interesting and that's what i loved about I, the relationship I don't between think the they humans had the and prime the directive at that time no they didn't the prime directive was later on but i'm talking about the philosophy that the prime directive was built on was the moral culpability of interference Right. I mean, do you just no, no, no. I, I agree that I mean, you can see the origins of you know that. Right. So that's principle. the point is the connection between why I love the Prime Directive and why I love the relationship with, is that idea of what do we, how far do we go in helping these people, and what is it? You know what I mean? I mean, am I is that connection clear? Oh yeah, no, you're. It's absolutely clear. And and Enterprise, for all of the hate that it gets, does have some very. Uh, interesting and captivating moments in it. And there's actually an episode of Enterprise. I want to say it was season one, but it could have been season two, where uh, Jonathan Archer is sitting there giving a, a speech to the crew on the bridge saying, you know, one day we're going to have to wrestle with these ideas of, of do yeah, we get involved then, or do we not? And, you know, eventually... Can't play God. Exactly. So it's it's that, as you said, that that initial idea of of rules to play by. 
Yeah, well, and people complain. So anyway, I guess I'm getting, I went way too far. So it's pre, it's the first warp drive. It's the idea of what would it be like to be the first people, you know, not like Star Trek where you're the first people that would be out in deep space, but just to be the first people to actually be outside of our solar system. And I love the idea that like I could see myself on the bridge of the NX-01 because that's technology that I think like is achievable within my lifetime. And to me, TNG... I was talking to Johnny about this earlier. TNG is God era. TNG, you're already at the point where it's your humans are basically magic. The technology is basically the force in TNG and just whatever the computer needs to do, whatever the processor, we can do it and we can figure it out. And it's just like the force. We can just, whatever, it's all there. It's, it, it is sort of the ultimate Deus Machina. It's not Ex Machina. It is the machine. It's the God machine. And I like that on Enterprise that the transporter can't transport. They've never really tested it on humans before, so they can't trust it. And, um, and, uh, you know, they have they only do it for biomedicine, so they're still using shuttles. But I feel like you see the connection between sort of the god world of TOS and TNG and the world we have now. And you can see people being on the bridge of the NX-01, and you can see how the NX-01 leads to TOS. And you can see all these little pieces that got set up 60 years ago are very respectfully and very thoughtfully kind of being set up. And again, you know, they don't hit it. There's definitely conflict between do we want to do serialized seasons and do we want to do sort of episodic seasons? And a lot of that was pressure from the network. And I'm going to be controversial. I think the Zindi were just unnecessary. I think it was a lazy thing. You could have just had well thought out conflicts between the Romulans that we aren't technically supposed to see yet, but you could still at least have dived a little bit into the first Romulan, which is what I feel like Enterprise really should have been. It should have been sort of the discovery of that first kind of Romulan war. Uh, human interaction and that first war that kind of set everything up. So I, uh, I think I might be going a little bit over time here, but uh, Enterprise gets a lot of hate and uh, rightfully so, you know, it's not perfect. But um, as someone who came at it very separately with no effect, you know, just coming at it as a third party observer, I thought it was a very logical and very thoughtful and very, um, it was really the best way you could have done that kind of idea. What's what's interesting to me with Enterprise is that it had all of the elements to, that you need, I think, to have a good, successful Star Trek show. Like, I, I love Scott Bakula. Um, and, and yeah, he's great. God, yeah, he's great. I and, love him. And like the... Uh, the set looked exactly as you would think it would look for sort of not quite the original series technology, but a little bit above where we're at right now. Cause you could like see the fans on the computers. Like, you know, it was all stuff that were like, Oh, I could go down to radio shack and buy something that looks something like this. Yeah, And you can see the progression of like, this is like a hundred years from now. This is totally what, you know, and the outfits, like, that's why I kind of love the uniforms. Cause it's like, this is a NASA space, you know, it's that weird, uh, it's not as smooth and crisp, and, but you can see, especially, unfortunately, if you look at discovery, you know, cause they're basically using originally the enterprise uniforms, but it's again, it's that, it's that bridge, especially when you talk about, again, the Mike mentioned earlier, that speech where he says, you know, until we come up with some kind of prime directive, I guess I'll have to remember, I can't play God. And I just love the opportunities to really kind of explore those ideas without those principles being established, but not being, to me, too contrived. Yeah, I just I don't know with that show because it had all the elements there, but it just didn't really mix well. Um, I don't know. I don't think they knew what they were doing. I think there was a lot of confusion and the network wanted things. And it's too bad because I feel like now, especially with The Expanse, would be the perfect time for a show like that with streaming and stuff that it could really be, you could really do something cool with it. Kind of like they did with the movies. If you Mm -hmm. came back 10 or 15 years later, man, you could dive into that Romulan war and, Oh man, how fun would that be on a streaming service where you could do, you know, seven seasons. But like, uh, like the, like, I I don't know if it was like, cause they always would like go to the, the mess hall all the time and every episode they were eating. That's all they ever did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Or like, you never saw the chef. Yeah. Or, or, well, you, uh, you do it the last episode. 
kind of. Oh, it's not really uh, him, yeah. you know. Or, or like, I, th- I think maybe a lot of the humor also just didn't land. Like you were saying, like, oh, I wish I had some sort of a prime directive or when uh, the other guy's like, we should have a read alert instead of a red alert because the guy's name was Reed. But I mean, they've had red alerts yeah. for, at that time, hundreds of years. I mean, submarines, like, anyway. Um yeah, I, but I think just, you could say it, like in spaceships, you know. But I mean, yeah. you know, that's. A, but it, it just I feel it, like the only the humor came from flocks, and that was, but you know, that was the that was the yeah. really the the kind of the anchor point, yeah. and the rest of it was more sort of winks and nods. Yeah, but it, it just didn't congeal like I think um, the original series or the next generation. You think for you me think it was kind of two Guardians of the Galaxy, like what they had, we were talking about with DC in our Star Wars episode. They were trying to change it to a more comedic setting, and it just didn't call for it because Star Trek no, doesn't I, do that normally. I, or? No, I, I wouldn't say that they put that much comedy in there. Those were just kind of like but points. They, but they oh, yeah, no, I I we talked about, so yeah. talk about with Thor Ragnarok. They <laughs> no, it, it made it the weakest yeah. of the three. Yeah. We thought yeah. Yeah. No, it, it didn't have right. any of the, like the slapstick comedy that you found in like Ragnarok or anything like that. Mm. Um, it just, did you Gary, have you, I, I, it's just a silly question. Have you done, I mean, have you, you've, you've, I assume you've seen all, you know, you've, you've done your enterprise because most people, you know, gave up kind of after season two or whatever. So you like, You've done your enterprise dive and you went through it and you know where it kind of all went and everything with the last with the last episodes and all that. I assume yeah. you do, but I yeah. just I don't know for sure. So do you think that the Zindi thing, like I'm, you know, I'm not sold on that whole season three. I love the idea of serialized storytelling. And I love the idea that there's an overarching art, you know, story that we go through out that. But I just I I can't get past how much I hate the Zindi and how how cheap and you know, Brendan Braga, I guess maybe is one of the but it just I, I I and the temporal cold war, you know, again, it's just not wealth. I mean, but those those core elements, you know, you know, if executed if executed, if given the right execution. Well, without those, uh, without those again, stupid I think, things. I think the problem with that was that they tried because Star Trek's, you know, set up and you expect it to have a, like a story, like an A and a B plot that conclude generally at the end of the episode, where as with that, they extended out throughout the whole series. And I mean, you have to take into account, like, because I think that um, the Zindi War started at the end of season two, which would have been. 2002 2003 era so the, yeah. again and they were the like time, reflecting I mean, their times we were going into iraq uh you know we were in afghanistan so you know war was a very but what did you think about it like did you did you like a lot of people don't like the the departure like, and there was a lot of pressure from the network you know you need to stay with this one episode you know beginning setup and end resolution one shot you know kind of thing and the creators really wanted to go in a more you know let's have a long form story did you what did you think did you think that they should have stayed with that sort of traditional trek pattern or do you think that they had yeah. room to kind of take this i, I mean i don't I, think it could have worked in any way if they tried to do ser- if they tried to do whole season long plots it just doesn't work well for me the uh, star trek is i i think it could have worked in a way but i don't think that star trek is the right sort of vehicle to do that a whole series long because you well, like Mandalorian style where you have three or four episodes that actually progress the core story. And then you have two or three kind of filler adventure. episodes. You don't think even in that fashion, it could work. I mean, you know, it, it certainly could. I mean, you know, if you have, you know, the, the writers that are, are capable and the, um, you know, the show. Sure, runners, yeah. I guess yeah. that's the magic key, right? Yeah. I mean, like I, I, I couldn't say no, that it wouldn't work. Um, but I will just say that it didn't for your work. preference, for your taste, you know. Uh, gee, because like uh, I, one of the things that was that was nice about shows that would end, uh, you know, in a in an episode was you didn't have to see like the previous one to know what was going on. That's not such a big deal now, but like you know, in the '90s when Next Generation was on, like you might miss a show one week and you won't see it again. Um, I don't know. I I, I would I, I prefer I think the um, I, I think a Mandalorian kind of style could work um, for it. Yes. OK, so unfortunately, we do, we, we, we do have to move on from from this one because I, I, I want to pit you guys against each other here on the uh, what is better series and what are the better 
captains. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and run through uh, our synopsis on Discovery and Picard. Um, we're leaving out uh, like the animated series <laughs> and short treks and all that. Um, so Discovery, uh, Star Trek Discovery, uh, which is currently still on, is a direct prequel to the original series set roughly 10 years prior. Uh, the series itself centered around the voyages of the USS Discovery, a unique starship with an experimental spore drive. OK, commanded in season one by Captain Gabriel Lorca and in season two by Captain Christopher Pike on temporary assignment during a refit of the Enterprise. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Michael Burnham is the lead character of the series. Uh, apparently, this marked the first time that Star Trek has decided to feature a first officer as the lead. Um, apparently, the whatever I'm, I'm reading this off of uh, Wikipedia because nobody gives a shit about discovery and picard uh according to the panel uh i, I have no idea i didn't even know that much about any that of the is other correct ones. okay okay i'll um, research and it's P just very different it's that's what it seems like um and just let's i'm gonna lump picard in here too um and then we can do a we can do a brief round table on it um picard has have any of you guys actually seen that one it just came on last year just started last season should be in season one maybe going to season two have any luke have you started watching it or Michael, have you? I've only seen snippets okay. of Picard, not not all the way through, gotcha. um, because it's very uh, it's very difficult to get on board. With. Okay, you mean you don't want to pay to have CBS All Access just to watch Picard and yeah. Discovery? No. Did we all watch the first episode at least? I mean, I feel like that was the free one, right? Did we at least see that? I don't even think I saw that. To be one hundred percent honest watch it, with you, did have you seen all? Yeah, of that? I mean, it's on YouTube. OK, OK. What what it so is Picard about? Is it about the is it about Picard after Next Generation or is it about Picard beforehand or it's about Data's daughter? It's about the bastardization <laughs> of an entire series. <laughs> the ruination of all of Gene oh, Roddenberry's really? dreams. Perfect. Yes, that it's is, it, Soji is Data's daughter, but and it's about Picard saving Data's daughter. Yep, and okay, turning seven of nine into that seems a like you can make a, a movie out of that, or do like a, a you know a limited series with four episodes and be done. With no, it. we're gonna but launch do, a low fucking seasons. budget streaming service. <laughs> let's do two seasons. Um, I think it's pretty obvious why neither of these hit with with the uh, American audiences. So let's move on. Let's move on and, to the next thing. And, and, and just to talk about those for just a second, like like they. A very quick second. Yeah, a very quick second. I, <laughs> I mean, want to know why Johnny thinks it, they didn't. Hurt. Well, I mean, it's just because they're not Star Trek. I mean, it's just all combat. <laughs> it's it's like all of the Star Trek video games. And I always do this every time they release a Star Trek video game. They sucker me in, and then they're just like, we're not actually Star Trek. We're just space combat. <laughs> and that's all these are. And they're just very shallow to trying to appeal to the people that like J.J. Right. Abrams style stuff, which is not what a Star Trek fan is. Uh, and Gary, you feel very strongly about J.J. Abrams' adaptations of the Star Trek series. Oh, God, yeah. Correct? Oh, great. I can't wait to get into that. I'll uh, go to the mat. I'll go to the mat for the let, first one. Let's, let's, let's jump into some roundtable discussions here uh, since we're getting towards the end of the podcast. Gentlemen, what series is the best? Why? Michael, go. So, preface it by saying my favorite series is Voyager. Perfect. Um, the best series, however... <laughs> for everything that it does is probably the next generation. Oh, um, all right. Although Why? the original series obviously is is where it all started, where it okay. all gets its influence from everything. But the next generation struck a chord with, I think, a wider audience than what the original series did. Okay. It had that good, solid foundation to build from, but it built well. Um, it had a good ensemble, had good production, had good ideas. Um, had a steady flow to it and i think it set up uh what star trek is today uh, arguably okay. it probably set up more than what the original series did but that's that's a whole like two to three hour debate right there yeah arguably another episode another episode maybe uh gary best series uh for my money the best series is the next generation um so. i uh I, I really love the original series, so like these are two very close ones for me, but I'm going to have to edge it out to Next Generation. I think that Next Generation, I, I like the larger ensemble that they have and the the different stories that they get into, and you get more perspectives on it because you don't just have the the three primary characters. Sure. Um, it's not as stagnant with the storyline from episode I really episode. don't know if I'd say original series is stagnant. Um, like it's, it's <laughs> well, you said it only concentrates on yeah, three people and yeah. next, and next it's, generation. It, okay, is, it's more dynamic yeah, in that way. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, I just, for me, I also recognize there's a lot of nostalgia factor to the original, uh, the next generation. Sure. Um, but like it, it, 
more than any of the other series, it fills me with a sense of wonder and hope for the future. And I think that's what Star Trek is meant to do. Okay. Uh, Luke, I, I'm praying to God you, you don't sell out and agree with the other two, um, but it's up to you. This is a free country. You can speak your mind. Best series. So I'm going to go with TOS, uh, obviously, I think. <laughs> okay. Um, and here's, here's the position that I'm going to take. Um, everything that those guys have said is true about TNG, about yeah. it appealing to a broader audience, potentially adding more to the lore and adding more to the fan. I mean, when you look at, D if you consider Deep Space Nine and Voyager sort of, then that's inarguable because they definitely did expand it beyond. But my, I will say this, that this is the point that ne that I made at the beginning that neither of them addressed in theirs. And if we take away 30% for both of them for nostalgia, which I don't have, um, as someone who came into this with a uh, hatred of Star Trek and who, who went into TNG way more optimistic than I went into TOS, I have to say that if I had to grade TNG on a percentage, the strikes are a lot more often and the highs are higher. You know, TNG, the good TNG episodes are much better than the good TOS episodes. Again, I think you could watch the first, you could watch the first two and a half seasons of TOS all the way through and there's, Pretty much, other than where the children, when the children shall ru shall rule, <laughs> there's not a loss beat there. And I think TNG's got a lot of lows, and I think the highs are great, but I think overall those lows bring it down. And I think that consistent quality is um, is on the side of TOS. TOS did not achieve, you know, the best scores on a TOS episode are maybe 90%, and I would say the best scores on a TNG episode are 99. TNG had highs, but uh, TNG also had lows, and the highs, to me, don't overcome the lows. I think TOS is, not only did it build this whole world and did it have the wonderful character dynamic, and, you know, even including the movies, I think that Every episode is consistently pretty well done up until the last half of season three. And so you've got 75, 80, 90 percent of the episodes are rock solid. OK. All right. Uh, Gary, what do you think about that? How, how do, what do, you, do you think there's any weak spots in, in TNG? Because I know that's you, you've been talking about that for hell as long as we've been friends. Oh, and yeah. 20 TNG years has uh, some very weak spots. Okay. Uh, you think about um Season one uh, finale, uh, the neutral zone, where they find a bunch of people that were cryogenically frozen in the 1980s. One of them's a cowboy, one of them's a stockbroker, and one of them's a housewife. And uh, they're unthawed. Cool Ironically, it was TOS sounds crew. Like, that yeah, was, sounds you like know, it was Rod Berry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that, no that's a pretty bad episode. Like. And then you go to like the other book end, like you look at season seven, Sub Rosa, which is uh, Dr. Beverly Crusher's <laughs> last episode. Um, and she falls in love and kind of fucks a ghost. <laughs> Um, right. a reading term. a book too isn't that great yeah I mean uh, there are some lows um, and, <laughs> right, uh, fair so enough I, just like any other I, series I, I will admit that uh, there are more episodes that are like Ugh, for the next generation than there are for the original series okay. but next generation also ran a lot longer so if yeah, you're taking the right? yep. if you're taking the average then um, yeah. next generation would I guess have a lower score than the original sure. series I, 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 could com I could completely see that Michael I mean, I, I can I can see what Luke is saying, and I can definitely agree with it. Um, but as Gary said, TNG ran longer. It had more opportunity to be to hit those highs. It also sure. had more opportunity to hit those lows. Well, and almost three times it, as long. Almost three times as long. Is it? And it. Yep, exactly. It definitely yeah. did hit those lows. It, it definitely <laughs> did. The, the weird ghost thing. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> um, you can't spit at what TNG did. You know what I right, mean? I right. mean, like it was. So a question to both of you guys then. So. So, Michael, you had said that your favorite was Voyager and mm -hmm. Luke, you said your favorite was was Enterprise. So why are those not the best yes. ones to you guys? Because I guess it it depends on objectively speaking what the idea of best is. Right. And, uh, and I'm able yep. to try and separate that from what favorite is. I, okay. I have a exactly, you know, I have a preferred like as another way to put it is you, you got a table full of of food and you're trying to pick the food that's going to be the most nourishing to your body. Your favorite may be the pizza, but the best option may be the salad. Well, and this was, uh, this was a point that I had made to on the star Wars episode was, you know, um, it's not about what you like. It's about what's consistent with the character. And it's the same thing. Um, I love 
you know, enterprise, but I recognize that there's a lot of problems with it. And I wouldn't necessarily submit enterprise as this is the end all be all of Star Trek, but for the things that I like about Star Trek, I see a lot of that in enterprise and it really tickles that Star Trek nerve for me in the way, in the way that the things that I looked at that appealed to me in TOS. And so, but I'm, I, I, and perfectly able to make distinction and like, look, I love, I will sit around and watch enterprise, but I will never, I would probably never suggest anyone watch enterprise over TNG or TOS. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. So based on that, you've never seen it. If you've never seen yeah, it, if you, there's some, if there's one you want to see first, then you'd rec you'd recommend one of the others. All right. Fair enough. Uh, so who do you guys think is, who's the best captain? Who's the best captain, Gary? Oh, Cisco, no, no, Cisco, no, no doubt, huh? Cisco, all the way, <laughs> know, Cisco, so from, Cisco from, from Cisco from first to home. Okay, okay. No, I mean, clearly, if you're going Cisco, then I'm going Archer. <laughs> yeah, you have to. Not, not even Captain Archer. Archer from the show Archer, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I, the, the the there's a difference between the best and the most entertaining. Yeah. So sorry. The, <laughs> the best captain, I think, is clearly John Luke Picard. Um, he is like the ideal person you'd want to work for as a boss. He's wise and understanding ask for input um he's you know tries the diplomatic solutions he's uh you know very patient you know he's i think overall like when you think of like the ideal starfleet captain john luke picard is who you're gonna think of can i ask you how good is he at thinking on his feet i feel like if i'm if i'm traveling through you know, billions good. of billions of light years when i'm traveling just through endless space and we come across god knows what i've got to think quickly mm -hmm. how good was he at doing that compared to kirk um, well, uh, Captain Kirk definitely was the best at thinking quickly on his feet. I feel like oh that's, boy, the, yeah. that's, the, that's the most valuable arena asset is to all have. you got to say to that. Well, the thing is, what Picard could do is he could uh, manage his crew in the way that was the most efficient way. So he would go to them for advice and opinions, and that would expand his ability to do things. Whereas Captain Kirk was much more of a, and it's just the way the show was designed, perhaps, but he was much more of a, you know, me, Spock, and uh, McCoy. Kind yeah. of are going to fix this. Let's yeah. do this. And, you know, yeah. Scotty would kind of yeah. hop in yeah. there later when he wasn't uh, <laughs> drunk. Scotty would yell at the computer for a while. Yeah. yeah. Right. Michael? And because uh, I agree with Gary that, that Picard is is probably the best captain out of all of them. And this this interesting idea of, you know, who can think quicker on their feet? Is it going to be Kirk or is it going to be Picard? And, and more people kind of fall back on Kirk for being quick on their feet. Um but to me, Kirk represents and was a part of the old Federation, whereas Picard was part of the new Federation. And the, uh, the entire idea of the Federation was the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And while and Picard kind of embodied that because you could have the strongest captain in the world. But if the team that worked for him uh, was not a cohesive unit and did not work well, it was pointless. And Picard's strength was being able to manage, organize, um, and really embolden his crew and his his team to be able to perform the tasks that they performed, which was the entire idea behind the Federation to begin with. Um, whereas Kirk was more that early idea of we're, we're you know, a, a tight knit group of just a few individuals and we're going to work together to get this done. And, and they were successful at that. So it's, it's just two different arenas for that. So by himself, Picard was probably the strongest all around. If you combine, though, if you combine Spock and Kirk together, would they be stronger than Picard by himself? Yeah, then you get Cisco. Then <laughs> you get Cisco, okay. <laughs> the free-spirited one. I was going to say, <laughs> That's you one. need bones. You need bones, too. But I don't know. I would actually say... I think if it, if you if it came down to it, if it was Kirk, I mean, and we kind of saw this in generations, but they they couldn't get off each other's balls. But like, if you had Kirk and Pick um, and Picard together, and they were adversarial, I mean, I think obviously Picard would get his skull smashed in. Like, I understand that he's got a fake heart from when he got punked at the pool table. But like Kirk will bash you with a rock. Are, are you talking about like, just like one-on-one -on -one, like melee? Yeah, battle? just melee like battle we're, like like yeah. the arena instead of the Gorn. It's Picard. Well, sure, but I are there. It's like an old. Man. <laughs> I think Kirk's a little younger too. Yeah, but but uh, Luke, who would you say? Like, is probably it would the be like it would be 
it would be like double fist hacksaw, whatever that awesome double fist attack he does on the Gorn to his face, like a Mortal Kombat movie. And it would just be he'd be done. I, I, could, be I, I could I could imagine it, it would. He's much younger and virile, so I'm, I'm sure it would be. Who's your favorite? Who's your favorite captain there, Luke? My favorite? Oh, Scott Bakula. I love I love the combination of the. He's sort of like he's a combination of the 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 diplomacy of Picard and sort mm-hmm. of the cowboysiness of Kirk. But he's also got my favorite part is that sort of naive optimism of like until season three comes along and they is he the best though? Well, <sighs> oh, I don't know if he's the best. I mean, I think Kirk is probably the best. Well, yeah, um, are, are we asking like I, what again, captain I recognize you want to serve those, under? No, just, <laughs> no. I would want to serve okay. under Kirk. Absolutely. I would I appreciate Picard, but I would want to serve under Kirk. I would feel I would I would follow Kirk to hell. I would be nervous about Picard. Okay. Oh, Gar- Gary, the reaction from Gary is just wide eyed, like, what are you talking about, Gary? Uh, expand uh, did, on that. Uh, you, yeah. I, I don't think Picard would ever would ever want to go into hell. And if he went there, I don't think he'd do a very good job. Can you give me an example of anything that he did that may have made you feel that way? I think that Kirk is the person that I would just as I like that sort of more. It's not uh, it's the personality. It's I like that more braggadocious kind of 17th century captain as opposed to 18th century captain. That personality, that archetype of the Han Solo is more appealing to me. And I think what what I find appealing about it is because there's not as many rules, you have to think more on your feet and you have to be more self-reliant. And I tend to trust the judgment of those people more. More. And so I would be more comfortable under the leadership of someone who essentially has to figure it out himself and makes it work than someone who um, is, although very good, is playing to a set of rules that have kind of already been established. OK, OK. Um, I This is just a little quick one. I just thought it'd be, it'd be kind of fun if we're on the YouTube channel. Maybe you can pop up a couple pictures, Gary. Uh, but for those that don't know, uh, which which series had the coolest ship? Which series had, ooh, had the most badass ship? Ooh, that's you, tough. Know, you, can, that's you don't have to necessarily tough. describe what the ship looked like, but maybe, you know, maybe maybe certain ships had different features than others in other series. I really have no idea. So, um, Michael, let's start with you. Right. So if um, if we're going with the like the showrunner ship, the ship that they're operating on, yep. then Deep Space Nine blows them all out of the water. Now, that's a joke. So <laughs> Cisco uh, would be proud. I've, of al- you to I've say always that. been a fan of the Intrepid class starship. Right, which is Voyager. This Voyager, okay, yeah, yeah. Let, let us know the series too. Voy- I don't, I don't Voyager know. was was a ship that was meant for exploration and was meant for science missions. It was not a combat vessel. It was not a, you know, let's let's whip out our biggest ship and show it off to everybody as the flagship and make a statement. It was, hey, we're just here to get a mission done. Um, it was quick. It was agile. It was smart. It that's what it was designed to do. And it was able to pull off a lot of interesting things. Yeah, the saucer se- section didn't separate or anything like that, but it could go in the atmosphere, which was very useful. It's pretty cool. And it could break into three, right? Oh, Maybe. That's no, that was the Prometheus. Oh, yes. That's right. Yeah, you're thinking of the Prometheus. Um, From the... the- the alien franchise or is that another yes. ship? It, okay. <laughs> no, so there was, there was an world? episode right. of Voyager called Prometheus okay. where they had a, a vessel that could split into three. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, Voyager, it's, it's an interesting ship. I like it. It's, it's compact, but it gets the job done. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Luke, go ahead. Oh, so is this uh, best look coolest? You said it was coolest ship, right? Not yeah, our favorite. Most, or... No, it can't, no, I, no favorite ship. The most badass ship. Yeah. The one that you'd, you'd probably prefer to go into battle with, or I don't know, the one you think you'd uh, want to use to escape, uh, escape Klingons chasing you or something, uh, whatever you want. <laughs> so my favorite ship is the yeah, I feel like a hack now is the TOS with the flashy lights. Like I just love the old <laughs> with the strings on it. But I have to say, if I were to go in, I, I do love the design. Oh God, I know I'm going to get lampooned for this. Um, this is the one thing I will take from the Berman era movies is I do really like the design. And I know it sets up the JJ Abrams, but the, I can't remember if it is it the 1701 E, whatever variant it is that they have in the movies. 
um, I thought when I first saw it, I was like, wow, that's so different. But I kind of it kind of works. It almost kind of calls back to the uh, kind of the old Star Wars with the war kind of trying. I don't know. I, I, I like that. And I feel like if I wanted to be a captain, that might be the ship that I would be on. Um, and I, but I know people, <laughs> that's not very popular. You no, know, I mean, it was the sovereign class vessel and it served as the flagship for the Federation after the Enterprise D went down. So, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I don't well, take What happened to yeah. the Enterprise D? Why did it go down? Why did it go down, Gary? Would you like to regale us with that story? I feel like there's another, every time you'll do that, I know there's a story coming well, up. So let's, is there, is there a dispute? No, no, uh, there's no dispute. They, they uh, it was in the movie Star Trek um, Generations, and Deanna Troy had to pilot it for the first time, and she crashed it, unfortunately. Oh, good, I thought, oh, that was times. the C at the beginning, right? In Generations, that Alan Ruck is on. I is think that, that was the C, because the C the is B. the The C is yeah. the time warp one. Yeah. Uh, Gary, what was what? Uh, what's your favorite ship there? Which ones do you think is the most badass? Uh, well, I mean, like, if, uh, I think the uh, Intrepid from Voyager also is the, really? the most badass of the okay. ships. As Michael said, the Intrepid class is very interesting. It's the only one that uh, has like a code blue, which is where you land in an atmosphere, because most of the other ships can't do that. Um, That's pretty it, fucking cool. It, yeah, it's, yeah, it's got a really neat look to it, and... Um, I, I think that whoever designed it did a really good job for the show um, because the ship is really a character in and of itself in um, the Star Trek uh, TV shows um, because it, it's got a personality and a character to it. And, you know, I think really sets up, you know, the tone of the show. Well, because you look at like the original series, um, you know, you got your basically cigar tubes with LED lights inside of them. <laughs> um, and then you've got like a, a more advanced model for, uh, the next generation and you know each of the ships i think like because the next generation uh i think luke was saying it's like you know the really big impressive kind of flagship uh you know it's you know comfortable like ambassadors come on it um whereas like the original series ship is just more of a lean mean fighting machine kind of thing sure um and then the intrepid class is decked out for science um but if i was going to go into battle i'd probably take like a board cube <laughs> I've actually heard of that Good one, man. oddly enough. Yeah. So that's pop that's popular enough. Um, so for those of you wondering, the the reason we don't typically only talk about television series, it is something we we briefly cover, but primarily we're mostly films. Um with this one, the series were definitely more popular than the films altogether collectively. Um they've been around more and made a lot more money, um, from what I was looking up at least. Uh but really quick, I, I do kind of want to just go around the panel really fast and uh, I do want to hear about what you guys think is the best and weakest film in the Star Trek franchise. I think the one that ran the longest was um the original series crew. They had how many movies altogether? Six. Six. Okay. And Six, that was that yeah. was the most, right? Um so well, sort of seven if you I mean generations kind of. Is it? Okay. Gotcha. It's it's a mix, right? It's like it's, half it's, the they, cast they, came back. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember I do remember seeing that. Um so Michael, I want to start with you. Um give me your what you thought was it, just give us your favorite your favorite star trek film and then your least favorite right so uh favorite star trek film is probably going to be first contact um it's, it's oh wow yeah it's not a star trek movie it's definitely space adventure but okay. um i enjoy i enjoy the continuation of the best of both worlds and the continuation of that that idea of the borg um and kind of exploring again that that deeper, darker aspect of what the universe can be and what it can produce and the team coming together to try to overcome it. Um, so, yeah, that's my favorite. And if I had to choose one of the Star Trek movies to watch, that's the one I'm going to grab off the shelf first. Sure. It's the one I'm the most entertained by. OK, what do you think is the weakest one in the entire franchise? Oh, there's quite a few, few aren't weak there. ones. <laughs> um there's definitely quite a few weak ones. I'm probably going to have to go. I'm probably going to have to go with Nemesis for the weakest one. Shins up. Yep. I mean, and, and don't get me wrong again, because the same argument could be used against me as to why I like First Contact because it's a space adventure movie. But Nemesis was just strange. Um, it took a lot of what the next generation had built up and it kind of shat on it pretty hard um i also thought the death of a major character was pointless and ended up making it not really matter that much when they're like oh look well we have a replacement don't worry it's it's just a strange movie it's strangely paced it's yeah it's awkward 
That's probably the worst one. I, I sh and I should have, and maybe it doesn't matter, but I should have prefaced this entire question by saying that I am counting the J.J. Abrams movies as, as part of this. Okay, all right, just make sure. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to, Gary, I'm going to save you for last. I'm going to jump to Luke really quick because, um, anyways, for obvious reasons. Um, Luke, what's your uh, what's your your favorite of the film? Oh, gosh, that's tough. It's, uh, uh, all right. My, I will say my, I, I know the one that I hate the most and it's Into Darkness. Okay. Um, I just, I just hate that movie so much. I just, I feel like it's just an assault on my senses. This was the remake of Wrath of Khan, correct? For those that haven't seen this it, was okay. their, their, um, I mean, I, I mean, their desecration of Wrath of Khan, and um, I just, I, I, it, it's, it, it's exactly like Rise of Skywalker, and I mentioned this on the words like I can see that J.J. Abrams is so far out of his element in understanding what the themes of this property are, and he is just throwing everything at the screen to try and keep me just paying attention until the movie's over, and it's just vomit. I just, it's so, and I'm even down with Benedict Cumberpatch or whatever the fuck his name is with Bad being Khan close. because. <laughs> It was on Sherlock, so it's like, okay, I get that he could play smart guy with Sinister. You know, I, I know, I see what JJ saw there and like, okay, fine. But God, that movie is awful. And uh, I think, I mean, I, I really like Star Trek V with uh with socks with box brother cyborg and that one gets a lot of hate. And I just I don't think I mean I don't think you could look at the Wrath of Khan bastardization and say that that's anything other than just there's there's not a good minute in there i don't think and my favorite but your favorite though favorite is probably oh god i mean uh, favorite is probably wrath of khan classic that is the only star trek movie that i've seen multiple times actually i will have to say i've seen that one Rector's three times cut, and... you know the whole i want full but i that's the that's the one that i enjoy re-watching the most and i just i just love ricardo he's just so great and i love the callback to space seed which is one of my favorite episodes of the of the original series nice uh and so jump to gary and I, and I did for those of you that are gary seemed a little confused when i said for obvious reasons i'm going to save him for last for those of you that recall our other episodes gary, oh, gary has gary has yelled on the mountaintops his distaste for most adaptations jj abrams is in charge of whether it be um anything to do with star wars or star trek or anything that he's ever done pretty much um so i i i, I was want he nodding while i was bitching oh, about yeah. oh was yeah, he absolutely. Just michael was not a little bit too <laughs> um so it's, it seems to be the general consensus around this group um but i i'd i'd like i'd like to hear i'd like to hear gary's whole tangent and rant on it again so gary least favorite of the star trek films and feel free to rip abrams apart all right um well my favorite and my least favorite films are the mirror universe of one another. <laughs> you have Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, which is my favorite film of the franchise. Boy. And you have its evil mirror universe goatee wearing but twin, boy. which is Into Darkness. If you watch Into Darkness and you're a fan of Star Trek, and like especially if you've seen Wrath of Khan, everything in the movie Into Darkness is just this weird, twisted, disfigured version of what the Wrath of Khan is. Because the Wrath of Khan is at, at the end of the movie and Wrath of Khan, Spock is inside of the uh, the, the reaction chamber and gets a lethal do dose of radiation and, and dies. Whereas if you watch uh, Into Darkness, Kirk's in the reaction chamber. You know, it's just just everything that's it's just off kilter like that. And it's it's just really to somebody who likes Star Trek, it's very insulting, I think. And especially the fact that Kirk in Into Darkness comes back to life after three or four minutes of screen time between when he dies and when he's rejuvenated. And basically what they've done is they just take um, uh, Khan's blood to recharge him. So they're just going to basically hook him up to a blood pump and just drain his blood constantly. Would be the, you know, and then everybody could be immortal. Yeah. Uh, but like... The Wrath of Khan is really an interesting movie because a, a lot of it takes place um, in a nebula and their sensors are down. So it's very kind of submarine warfare. You're just moving cat and mouse like. And yeah. two captains. Very cold it, war. Yeah. <laughs> Ricardo Montalban is just, you know, he's like just at a 13 the whole movie, which is just beautiful. Like he's like, yes. like it, it just it parallels with Shatner's uh 
dramatic telling of Kirk so well. Um, and it's just a really well paced, well timed movie. That's really, um, like the ending of that movie. If you've, if you're a Star Trek fan is gonna, you know, bring a tear to your eye, make you cry. Cause it's just so well done. <laughs> and then if you look at into darkness, it's just, you know, an action packed, um, doesn't make any sense. Uh, like the plot's got a lot of holes in it and you know it's just it's just fight and fight and kill and punch and it's just not anything what Star Trek is whereas Wrath of Khan is the only plot hole it has is uh, Chekhov you know says to you know Chekhov recognizes uh, uh, Khan whereas in the actual uh, episode Chekhov wasn't on the show yet so that's really the only plot hole you could find in it. But um, it's just such a, a well-paced and put-together movie. And I think that Into Darkness is somebody who has no idea what the in intellectual property is and thought it'd be cool to kind of uh, subvert expectations in a way. And so uh, that's that's kind of what you get. I've heard that before. Well, and you know, one thing real quick about that, and I think it speaks to a point we were saying earlier, is Nick Meyer was a guy who was not a Star Trek fan, and he came in, and he knew nothing about it, and he just dove himself in, and he watched the original series, and he helped with the screenplay. Uh, you know, he didn't have any prior connection to it, but he respected it, and he knew, and he tried to learn the rules of the game, and he tried to make sure that he respected those rules. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Uh, okay, so I, I, I think we kind of already we touched on this a little bit, uh, and I'm going to give everybody kind of a, a wrap up chance here. Um, with Abrams, was J.J. Abrams just was he just not a fan of the Star Trek? series growing up um i mean we we came across this that. we came across this with oh he did okay so we came across it with like david lynch and and dune you know he said he was not a fan of the books he didn't want to do it really they just paid him a bunch of money and said go go have at it you know um but you know uh i thought he had claimed for that in the star wars i didn't know if he was supposed to be a fan when he was a child it's typically those are the people you want leading the charge. Um, so, Luke, I just want to run back it, run it back with you. You said that you would actually go to bat for the first Star Trek that he did, but not for Into Darkness and Beyond. Um, why, why, why would you go to bat for the first one and not the uh, the next two? Uh, for the same reason that I would go to bat for The Force Awakens, um, I don't think it's perfect, but I think given what he was told by the studio to do. And I think, you know, he he said that he wasn't uh, many times in interviews when he was doing promotion, particularly the famous clip is when he's on, I think, The Daily Show. Okay. Uh, and he says that he was told, and this gets into Les Moonves and why Enterprise was canceled because Les Moonves hated, hated sci-fi and he didn't like Star Trek. And he wanted to make, he didn't even know the difference. And so when he gave the property to J.J. Abrams, he said, you know, make it more like Star Wars, make it sell. <laughs> And so, you know, that was kind of what J.J. Abrams had to do. And again, I think that they messed around with canon. They did things that are questionable, sort of like they did in Force Awakens. But I think if you'd had a Nick Meyer or if you'd had someone there who really knew what they were doing, you could have taken that and you could have made something good with it. I don't think that the first one is the disaster that the second one was, just like I don't think The Force Awakens is the disaster that Rise of Skywalker is. Gotcha. Uh, Gary? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, for the J.J. Abrams versions, my favorite movie is actually the third movie that they did. Beyond, right? Yeah, because I think that's the closest to an actual Star Trek plot and outline that you have. And I think that uh, uh, Simon Pegg, um, had a lot more creative control and influence in that. Right. So it was the one JJ was least involved with. Yeah, exactly. Well, Ju Justin Lin directed, directed beyond the third one you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And Abrams, yeah, did yeah but Simon, two. I think he did the screenplay originally. I mean, he was a big part of the writing and you can he tell was, because yeah. there's a lot of, he and Doug, G there's a lot of just little tropes, apparently. the way, way uh, bones walks in after the first scene and he scans Kirk, you know, it's the only one that I have on Blu-ray too, because I think it's closest to, to what the original the series original was essence because, of the series. Uh -huh. yeah, for sure. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I would agree with that. I think to uh, the end of darkness was the weakest of the Abrams. Uh, then the first one was the mid one. And then the last one was the strongest. Uh, Michael, do, do you agree with these guys? Do you think that that Abram, do you think that all three of Abrams versions are just as bad as Luke and Gary are saying, or are you not as much of a hater as these two? Well, and I guess it's I guess it all comes down to personal opinion, obviously. True. Um, that it does. But 
for what it's worth, again, I mentioned it before growing up, started watching Star Trek with my dad, right? So obviously dad is a fan of Star Trek. Dad actually watched the original series when it first aired on TV. Went to every single opening night of every single Star Trek movie. Wow. As it's he, was come a, out. he was a he, he was part of the first generations of Trek. Yes. Okay. He, he was right. a diehard fan. Gotcha. My father's one of his favorite Star Trek movies is Into Darkness. And I, I asked him about it one time and I said, you know, it's don't you see it as as a little bit disrespectful? And he said, Why would it be disrespectful? They're two different movies. Yes, they they play off of each other, and yes, they they kind of brings up that those ideas that were presented in Wrath of Khan and try to do the uh, subvert your expectations type thing that is so popular nowadays. But he said, I was genuinely entertained by the movie, regardless of anything that happened after the movie, before the movie, anything outside of it. For those two, two and a half hours I was sitting in that movie theater, I was entertained by that movie. And I believe the people around me were entertained as well. One of dad's favorite moments in that movie was um, when Cumberbatch reveals he's like, my name is Khan. There was actually a little kid that was maybe seven, eight years old that was three rows in front of us. And he was like, yes, like you heard the kid audibly react to that because he thought it was cool and he recognized the name Khan. And so, you know, we could you could debate back and forth all day long, whether they're good movies, whether they're bad movies, whether they're still in in line with what Star Trek is. But for some folks out there, for some diehard fans, for some folks that grew up with it, were there for the original, they were entertained by that movie. And ultimately, that's the goal at the end of the day. You know, I, I think that for someone like me, who's not a purist of the original series of any of them, honestly, seeing seeing all three remakes beyond was my least favorite, you know, just from a pure movie standpoint, if I just saw these movies standalone, like your dad, you know, um, I liked first Star Trek and I liked Into Darkness, but I also loved Wrath of Khan. Like I said, I saw it three times. Um, so I think it just depends coming from someone like me that just likes film in general and just going out it i thought the storyline was compelling enough and the characters were entertaining enough there was enough action to where i was you know i was enthralled and i continued to watch the entire time and i didn't find it to be boring um but i could totally see coming from the purest perspective that it doesn't it doesn't follow the original formula of the of the star trek universe at all so i could totally see where you guys are coming from it's not even that. It's just a bad movie. I don't care if it follows the formula, but the script is sloppy. It's contrived. The action pieces are so over the top and so overdone. I mean, it has nothing to right, do but with... but that's what I want. That's I mean, what I, that's what I want is from a, from, a spa, from a space movie, from an action movie. That's what I want to see. I, I want to be part of the... the I want to be part of the masses that just want to be dumb for 20 minutes and just watch a, a, a Star Wars scene, you know? Um, it's just a space adventure to me, you know? Um, and yeah, you're right, totally. Yeah, this, and that's why the first the one is yeah, good, so, but I think the... This, this the second one even fails, you know, again, like Rise of Skywalker, you know, there's 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 a difference between, hey, let's have some fun and let's do Michael Bay and let's oversaturate this to the point where it becomes and, kind and of mind numbing. And right. I think you saw the same response from the audience is that how I mean, Rise of Skywalker had to scrape over the billion dollar line. Right. But it still did. You know, and you say my, you say I the mean, Michael Bay oversaturated later, stuff. For a Star I'm, Wars movie, right. I mean that's but not I, very with good. With oversaturated stuff with Michael Bay, I, dude, I like Michael Bay movies. I like the Transformers movies, not all of them. I mean, obviously, just like I said, with the with the plot holes, with character arcs, making people relatable. Yeah, they did a horrible job of it. And when I put stand it up to the the test of time of uh, the fucking Lord of the Rings or Goodfellas or any of my favorite films. No, of course not. But I went and I enjoyed and I didn't regret spending 10 bucks to actually be entertained for those two hours. I didn't I didn't need every movie I see doesn't need to be this compelling storyline that makes me think about other people's perspectives and a, a different view on the world around me. Like it's if it's just no, a it bunch of fucking explosions either, and people getting killed, to be competent. I'm no, it doesn't. That's my point. Like, that's why people yeah, love, love these. Competent. That's why people. I mean, that's why people love these big budget blockbusters. Is because it doesn't need to be competent. Because they're going. No, they're just mild, for, They're competent. They're tight. They've got a few beats they have to hit. They hit them, and then that's what they do. I'm not saying they're sophisticated, but they're competent. Okay. I mean, so you're saying? Would you say that Michael Bay's Transformer films? I'll, I'll use those because that's what are. I mean, obviously, famous for. it did what it was supposed to do. Right. I think that Michael Bay obviously hit the beats. I don't think this is in the. I mean, I think. It, when I met Michael Bay, I mean, in the vein of way too far on the realm of visual effects and using the visual effects to distract from a relatively weak mediocre script, script I mean, or something, from a very yeah. weak script. No, I, I, yeah, no, I knew what you meant. I, I was saying that I think it, it had enough 
of that to keep people entertained. That hence why it made so much money. Yeah, I I don't think Star Trek lends itself to a movie format very well. It, that's what I was going to say earlier. Was what it's if tough. they never made it's movies tough. for Star Trek? And I would I would I would agree. Oh boy, that'd be screwed. Yeah, and but they're they're not Star Wars. The, yeah. It seems like these stories need to be told delicately and have a have a personal touch and told over an extended period of time because it's it's so well, intricate. I, I, There's so I, many I think moving the problem pieces. Is when you try and make a movie, you're you're going to try and bring in too much money. Whereas Star Trek Star Trek's not about necessarily making um, a huge amount of money. Like you, need, you don't need to make a billion dollars. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and that's why you shouldn't have it as a movie because it 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 you try to broaden it out too much and mm-hmm. star trek um at its heart and its core i think is a story about it uh living up to you, you the best of humanity and and being that best and i don't think that uh a bunch of ex- like in the next generation um there's a scene where um picard is arguing with a another alien and they're going over a, a treaty that's like five hundred thousand words and uh you know, that's pretty boring. Like not, not a lot of people are going to tune pretty into that, but it, stuff. It, it's a really uh, <laughs> exciting, like it, in the moment, like it, Prequels. yeah, like in, in the moment, like it, it's a very interesting thing to watch. Yeah. But I, mean, I don't think you're going to bring in a billion dollars with. As I say, the trouble too, is when you do a Star Trek movie, and I think maybe this is kind of, maybe this is your point, Johnny. It's like, you're basically doing two episodes of Star Trek. You know what I mean? Yeah, so like, ideally, who's going to pay to go to the movie? Th- like you have to do, you you kind of have to do something extreme, right? From from a creative perspective, it's like, okay, what is the story that is so urgent that we have to tell it in this big right. setting in two hours? So then you get these end of the world, you get the, you know what I mean? Yeah. You get these constantly escalating stakes. But then but then also like if you look back at the original movies, you know, they didn't really do that. You know, it wasn't, you know, there was there was kind of, I guess, an end of the world element, but a lot of it was a lot of it was just going to V'ger and figuring out what's going on with V'ger, dealing with the probe, dealing with Cybok, and then right. in you know an undiscovered country, which is a lot of people's favorites, it's just negotiating with the Klingon. The stakes aren't necessarily like super the high. way they are <laughs> in Star Trek One, where it's like the planets are fucking falling apart and the universe is exploding. You know, there's there the stakes are there, but they're not like they don't seem to be sort of like terminal where it's like, if they right. don't so in all of the movies, you know what I mean? Obviously some, but every time it's not the end of the world. Sometimes it's just, here's a problem within the context of these characters. Yeah. I, I think maybe in general, maybe just TV series shouldn't try to make films at all. You know, I mean, you look at uh, breaking bad, in my opinion, one of the top three greatest written movie. series Gosh. ever. Month. And they did, they, it was called El Camino and it was about the story after Walt's death. And it was about Jesse Pinkman's uh, basically. I didn't his know that. That's the movie. Yeah. It's on Netflix. Uh, and you, you can watch on Netflix. Oh, uh, Yeah. I've yeah. seen it, but I didn't know. Oh, okay. Yeah, it just, okay, it's, cool. it's literally just this crime Western essentially where he, he's trying to, he's trying to flee the guys that, that, uh, that killed him. Uh, that killed Walt, uh, or that were connected to killing Walt. Exactly. Yeah. And it was just an extended breaking bad episode. Anyways, my point being is that it just, it fell flat and it, it, you're not going to put that in theaters and get a big, a big group of people coming to see it. You know, it's going to be a select group and they're going to want to watch it from the comfort of their own home. And you see that with the star Trek series, which I think was the problem you guys are talking about is people will go see it, but not as many people will go see that as they will go see a Marvel movie or a star Wars movie. Um, because those are, those are movies like they're, they fit into the movie criteria. Yeah. Star Trek should be, it should be episodic. Wrath of Khan worked. Yeah. And Wrath, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, they great. worked for right. all of us. Like some of there's them a worked. formula of them there. Worked. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's some there's a formula there. I don't know what it is, but it's possible, right? I mean, I wouldn't say it's not possible. Like you could, someone could do it. It it has been done. It could be done. Yeah, but it's maybe it's just really hard. Maybe maybe I, mean, it I is. guess it is obviously really hard. But hey, the, in the at the end of the day, Star Trek is a multi billion dollar franchise when it's all said and done with uh, with all their profits. So they must be doing something right going going all the way through. Yeah. Right. And I mean, the the only thing I was going to say was that um, when it comes down to it, talking about certain TV shows that shouldn't be made into movies and and that it may not hold up to uh, to the medium, because I was trying to think about it earlier today, um, just kind of randomly popped into my head thinking about TV shows that had then spun off into movies. And really, there's only three franchises that have really done that 
successfully and and one of them is even an arguable franchise uh star trek what are, what are which they? is probably the most successful of them um mission impossible was the other one uh, with how many movies it's produced and how much money it's made and then the third one whether it's a franchise or not um the saturday night live films of the 90s was the <laughs> yeah. other oh, one that's a good see, pick that's uh, a good pick the Blue scenes, Brothers, yeah. but um the really the, there's not very many television shows out there that are going to hold up i mean you, you've got one-offs like maverick was one yeah wild, and- wild west which was oh that's that's ended up itself it so what well it is, in 98 but, um, <laughs> will smith had a great rap no. yeah sure he gave up the matrix in order to do it um <laughs> i know isn't that crazy <laughs> it's nuts he it's... still defends it he put a video on his youtube being talking about like how the wachowski brothers weirded about i was like bro you turned on the matrix like what do you have to say other than my bad that's so funny matrix is honestly the next series i want to go over um <laughs> oh there's so much there. there's unfortunately, so much there. unfortunately guys we are all out of time for tonight um thank you guys uh michael and luke thanks so much for joining us um this was certainly a, a certainly an interesting one uh before we go uh, i really quick want to let our panel go ahead and give their recommendations this week for our listeners to take a watch to um you can either uh, preferably if you wouldn't mind choosing uh either a sci-fi or a star trek film um, that you could recommend to the to the audience here and let them know what they should uh, what they should take uh, take a take a take a gander at um i'll let everybody take a minute to think about it i'll go first um since i don't know nearly as much on the subject as you guys and uh i'm gonna go on ahead i'm gonna steal wrath of khan since it's really the only one i've seen multiple times uh even as a kid i really loved it uh and i know they've got the iconic khan scene but as gary said really the the tension in this movie i mean you could you could you could just cut it with a knife it's it's so well done. It's it's the only one because I I've actually seen all of them at least once. Most of them were when I was a teenager. My dad used to love them. Um, it was the only one that I actually thought fit that movie format we were talking about. And Luke, you brought it up earlier, you know, saying that same thing that maybe it was the only one that actually was successful at that. Um, so, yeah, that would be my recommendation if you haven't seen it or if you have see it again, because it's actually a good fucking movie. Um, Gary, let's jump to you. Uh, my recommendation for uh what to watch is going to be a television show called the Orville. Um, I know we oh, were looking for movies, but uh, no, it's okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, these yeah, are okay. Yeah, it's Seth MacFarlane, okay. and um, Love Orville. I would say that the Orville is the most Star Trekky thing that has been made since the early two thousands. Uh, at, at least it's since uh, <laughs> Enterprise went since off Enterprise. the air. Um, it, the first season kind of takes a minute to kind of get going to find its uh, stride. Uh, but uh, really, uh, it's solid and it's got a lot of the the elements that Star Trek needs to have in it. Absolutely. Uh, Michael, how about you? So if you're looking for a Star Trek movie to see, uh, just go pick up First Contact, turn off your brain and enjoy a nice little a nice little action <laughs> film. Yeah, nice little slice see of some, paradise. Yeah, <laughs> see some people just not be the character they were ever intended to be. But, you know, it's fun when they start screaming and yelling and stuff like that. Um, But if you're looking for a a really good science fiction film, go back to 1953 and uh, take a look at A War of the Worlds. Not 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 the most recent one. 1953, Um, when half the movie takes place in a lab and there's a lot of just fun banter back and forth. And it's it's a good, just good, traditional 1950s sci fi film. Yeah, good pick. Good pick. Luke? I've got one, and this is one that I will preach about any chance I get because I really do think it's underrated. Um, And I'll go to the mat for this one. Um, Event Horizon, uh, 1997, I believe. uh, Paul W.S. Anderson, who did such a wonderful, loyal, one, you know, first successful video game adaptation with Mortal Kombat. Event Horizon is such a wonderful combination of essentially sci-fi and real like horror, murder horror of the way that they conceived hell was so, it was so perfect for if you could conceive a realm of torture. And the theme is basically they send a ship that's like Star Trek, it can go to warp, it warps somewhere, they disappear, it comes back and they don't know what happened, the crew's dead and the ship, you've learned it throughout the show that the ship has basically been to hell and back in the star trek sense and it's sort of this you know this horror sci-fi of the ship you know trying to get back and it's just great and it's so underrated and i think it had a bad you know it opened against a lot of movies that were a lot better than it was but it's a good one and i definitely recommend it great film you know it was funny i've seen a 
couple times and I've, I've never actually been scared of it. Maybe it's because I saw it when I was in my mid 20s and people were like, oh, it's the scariest movie you'll ever see. And I felt the same way when I saw the Blair Witch Project. I was 25, 26 when I saw both of them. And I was like, Blair Witch Project just sucked. Um, but Event Horizon was great. I, I just treated it like a it. sci-fi. It's a good. Yeah. Oh, it's a fantastic movie. Yeah. I love Sam Neill's just always, always, always a delight. Great. Yeah, he's, great. he's always good. Um, anyways, uh, Michael and Luke, thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to do this again and uh, see how popular this episode is. If it warrants us having a second episode, we will certainly uh, extend an invitation back out to you guys to come on back on. Sounds good. All right. Uh, uh, Neil had to get off earlier, uh, but he will be back with us next week. Uh, I'm Johnny. I'm Gary. You guys stay classy. We'll see you next week. Thank you for tuning in to Leadfeather Productions podcast of I Don't Give a Flick. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast so that you never miss an episode. Podcasts are available on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and everywhere podcasts are hosted. I Don't Give a Flick is hosted and produced by Johnny Blackburn, Gary Elmore, and Neil Riley. Executive producer, Johnny Blackburn. Technical director, editor, and audio mixer, Gary Elmore. I Don't Give a Flick is a Leadfeather production. Copyright Leadfeather Productions 2021.